In this video, we will be exploring the entire fifth tier of the largest unsolved mystery iceberg ever made. The full iceberg has over a thousand entries, and in this video, we will explore mysteries that range from the greatest UFO incident ever experienced or documented in the world, to the really strange, eerie disappearance of two Dutch students in South America, to two of the most mysterious, unusual medieval codexes that contain some absolutely wild stuff written by unknown and seemingly impossible authors. These are just a few of the cases covered, and the rest range from missing persons to serial killers to unsolved murders, to hoaxes, cryptids, paradoxes, and much, much more. This video is a supercut of every video I've made in the fifth tier, and so it contains a ton of cases. I've removed all of the intros and outros for them, cleaned them all up a little bit, and so with all that being said, please enjoy this supercut of the fifth tier of the unsolved mystery iceberg. So without further ado, grab a drink. My choice today is black coffee with cream and join me as we explore the unsolved mystery iceberg. To start off with, we have the monster with 21 faces. So this was a case that sounds like it's straight out of a movie or a novel or something. Even the name, the monster with 21 faces, was based on and inspired by another villain. In a Japanese mystery novel, the fiend with 20 faces. So it was 1984, March 18th, when two masked men armed with a pistol and a rifle, broke into the home of Katsuhisa Izaki. Katsuhisa was the president of Izaki Glyco, which was this huge food processing company headquartered in Osaka, Japan. And Katsuhisa's night was only about to get worse. Now, the two armed men had broken into Katsuhisa's home using a key that they stole from next door in which Katsuhisa's 70-year-old mother lived. Now, Katsuhisa's home had a security system, which makes sense for the CEO of a large company, but his mother's house just next door didn't really have much security it seems. So they broke into her house, cut the telephone lines, held the mother hostage essentially, tied her up with these very same telephone lines, and then they forced her to give them the key to Katsuhisa's home. Because she was the mother, I guess she just had a spare key with her. So at around 9pm, the two men entered Katsuhisa's home. They tied up his wife, Mikiko, and their seven-year-old daughter. Mikiko actually offered the two men money, and one of them just said, be quiet, money is a relevant, which is not really what you want to hear during a break-in. But again, they cut the phone lines for the house and found and abducted Katsuhisa naked while he was bathing, bringing him to a small warehouse on the other side of Japan. So what did these men want? I mean, they said that money was irrelevant, so they could want anything, really. But they wanted money. At around midnight that night, they contacted another higher-up at Azaki Glyco and directed him to a ransom note left in a public phone booth. This this note demanded 1 billion yen and 100 kilos of gold, which all worked out to around 5 million dollars or 15 million dollars in today's money. So as they were panicking and worrying and trying to figure out what to do with this whole situation, should we not negotiate with terrorists? Should we hand over the money? How much time do we have really? Are there going to be other attacks? If we are going to give the money, what's the best way to hand it over? And during all of this, Katsuhisa escaped. After three days of being tied up in this warehouse, he he was able to break free of the ropes and make his escape. He fled the warehouse, got to safety, but he was unable to identify his kidnappers or to give really clues of any kind, which is a bit unfortunate. So the kidnapping group was probably a little annoyed that their main bargaining chip had just escaped and they weren't willing to give up their potential paycheck just yet. Over the next few weeks and months, several of the company cars at Azaki Glyco were set alight, a tub of hydrochloric acid Acid was found inside of a Glyco building, and several letters were sent to Glyco, the media, and the police. One of them reads, To Japanese police fools, are you stupid? There are so many of you, what on earth are you doing? If you are real pros, try catching me. There's too much handicap, so I will give you a hint. There's no fellows in the Izaki's relatives. There's no fellows in Nishinomiya police. There's no fellows in flood fighting corps. Car I used is grey. Food was was bought at Daya. If you want a new info, beg for it in the newspaper. After telling you all this, you should be able to catch me. If you don't, you are tax thieves. 
Shall I kidnap the head director of the prefectural police? They sent letters to the media basically taunting and degrading the police, saying how incompetent and useless they were. And one letter which was sent to the media and Koshian police read, To police fools. You shouldn't lie. If you lie, you steal. I also sent this to Koshian police. Why are you lying? Don't hide things. Why are you complaining? You guys are having such a hard time, so I will give you a hint. I entered the factory from the side staff entrance. The typewriter we used is Panwriter. The plastic container used was a piece of street garbage. And it was signed, the monster with 21 faces. Then, after taunting the media, the police, providing them with a bunch of clues that didn't really move the case forward in any way, the monster sent their first letter directly to Izaki Glyco. The letter said that they had laced $21 million worth of the company's food with potassium cyanide, which is extremely deadly by the way, and they threatened to put them onto store shelves, which I don't think was an empty threat as this guy was actually captured on CCTV placing Izaki Glyco chocolates onto a store shelf. This image was released to the public but the man was never identified. None of these poisoned sweets or candies were ever found, but regardless, a ton of their products were removed from store shelves, and over 450 part-time workers were fired, I'm guessing for security reasons, as they didn't really know who was poisoning these foods. And months later, the monster with 21 faces issued a message saying that they had forgiven Glyco, and from then on, all the letters and harassment actually stopped. They never did find out who was responsible for these attacks or who the monster with 21 faces actually was, but by the end of this entire ordeal, Glyco had reportedly lost nearly $130 million in decreased sales and revenue. So you'd think that would be the end of it, but it wasn't. The monster with 21 faces was done with Glyco, but it then turned its focus to another food processing company, Morinaga. They sent a letter to Mitsuo Yamada, who was the vice president of Morinaga at the time, and again threatened Morinaga with the poisoning of some of their products. The letter read, To President, you saw our power, didn't you? If you disobey us, we will destroy your company. You will get killed. Decide whether you want to give us money, or do you want to see your company destroyed? Tell us in the Mainichi newspaper on either the 5th or 6th of November. Use the missing persons. Use these words in the reply. Jiro Morinaga, mother, police, bad friend, money, meal. As we said before, we want 200 million yen. Monster with 21 faces. Morinaga responded to the criminals by, as they requested, posting a missing persons ad in the newspaper. The ad read, Dear Jiro, bad friend disappeared. Come back. War meal is waiting, Mother Chiyoko. They agreed to pay the monster with 21 faces, and while dropping off the requested money at a train station, this man was spotted, seemingly watching the whole drop off. He was trailed by the police, but was eventually lost, and he was never identified. By the end of all of this, and after following up on over 28,000 tips, and after investigating nearly 125,000 persons of interest, no one behind the monster with 21 faces faces was caught or identified, and at his apparent shame of failure to catch these people, the superintendent Yamamoto of the Shiga prefecture ended his own life by self-immolation, which is a pretty horrific way to go. The final letter from the monster to the media read as follows. Yamamoto of Shiga prefecture police died. How stupid of him. We've got no friends or secret hiding place in Shiga. It's Yoshina or Shikata who should have died. What have they been doing for as long as one year and five months. Don't let bad guys like us get away with it. There are many more fools who want to copy us. No career Yamamoto died like a man. So we decided to give our condolence. We decided to forget about torturing food making companies. If anyone blackmails any of the food making companies, it's not us, but someone copying us. We are bad guys. That means we've got more to do than bullying companies. It is fun to lead a bad man's life the monster with 21 faces. If you are enjoying this video, you may enjoy many more, as I do weekly videos exploring many dark, mysterious, fascinating, and interesting things. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon so you are notified for every video that goes out. Tip the like button if you are liking the video so far, but for now, let's get back to the video. 0888 888 
eight, eight, eight. First of all, this annoys me as there are nine eights and not eight eights. But this was a Bulgarian phone number that was suspended forever because everyone who had the phone number strangely died. The first owner of the phone number was the CEO of the telephone number issuing company, and he was Vladimir Grashnov, who died of cancer in 2001. But this was suspected to be a radioactive poisoning by a rival company. Then a member of the mafia, Konstantin Dimitrov, took the number and was killed by an assassin in the Netherlands in 2003. Then in 2005, the number went to Konstantin Dishliev, who was subsequently killed outside an Indian restaurant in Bulgaria. And can I just say this whole thing reminds me of something like the Elder Wand in Harry Potter, where somehow this telephone number gives you these crazy powers or something, and people are just like killing each other left and right to get the telephone number, but it's probably not that. And so after these deaths, the telephone number was suspended and never put back online. Whoever calls it gets the same outside of network coverage message, and it doesn't look like the telephone number will ever be made available again. The 1994 Rua UFO in Incident. This is a reference to the UFO sighting outside of Rua, Zimbabwe in 1994. There were 62 pupils between the ages of 6 and 12 that said that they saw a silver alien craft descend from the sky and land on a field nearby their school. Now, as we all know, kids never lie about anything or are wrong about anything whatsoever. So when a bunch of these children also claimed that some creatures dressed in black came out of the craft and spoke to them telepathically about the environment, we should absolutely, unequivocally believe them all always. The incident went out on local radio and quickly became the most famous UFO sighting in the whole of Africa. Pretty strange one, but I think if aliens truly cared about our environment, they wouldn't be crimping all of our bloody corn just to make shapes in a field. Abigail Williams is an interesting one. This was a 12-year-old girl who, along with her 9-year-old friend Betty Paris, were the first children to falsely accuse their neighbours of witchcraft in 1692. And these accusations eventually led to the Salem witch trials. Three women were arrested in this incident, one of which being the household slave of the Paris family. She was apparently tormenting the children in the Paris household with her spectre or ghost. So yeah, pretty vague, unprovable accusations. The judge at the trial asked the children to look upon this woman, and all of the children said that yes, her spectre had tormented them. God, people were fucking stupid in those days. The judge asked her why she was tormenting these children with her spectre. And she basically said, look, I don't know what you're talking about. You brought me here and I don't know anything about a spectre. I am, of course, paraphrasing that, but that is basically the gist of what she said. The three women were interrogated and essentially turned against each other, with each woman thinking that they could escape these insane charges if they just said that the other women were witches. This kind of worked and all three women were kept in jail. One died in prison, one was executed that year, and the Paris house slave was released from jail a year later, and then sold on. So yeah, pretty nutso one. And it's kind of wild to think that this whole Salem witch trials thing actually happened, but it did, and it was a strange time. Agatha Christie's disappearance. So Agatha Christie was pretty cool. For those who don't know, she is incredibly well known for her mystery novels, such as Murder on the Orient Express and Death on the Nile, featuring the famous Belgian detective Hercule Poirot. Hercule Poirot. Born Agatha Mary Clarissa Miller, she married Archibald Christie, a pilot, when she was 24. The marriage was going well until it wasn't. Agatha's mum died from bronchitis, and shortly after, it was discovered that Archibald was having an affair with his secretary and was looking for a divorce from Agatha. This obviously must have been very stressful for her, and one day, Agatha Agatha just left the house, going completely missing until her car was found the next day. It was found in the morning, several miles away, having veered off the road into a bunch of bushes. Agatha was missing, the car and headlights were still on, but her suitcase and coat remained in the car. So it seems like we've got a little mystery on our hands. And obviously this was front page news. A massive manhunt was undertaken, a local lake, the silent pool, was actually dredged and searched. As Agatha often wrote about the lake being haunted in her novels, so maybe she had been attacked and drowned by 
by a not so friendly ghost. <laughs> but she wasn't. Her body wasn't found and the home secretary even sought help from fellow mystery writer and creator of Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, which is a wicked move to pull. So this was like something straight out of one of her novels. Her car was abandoned, she was missing, there were some clues there, but nobody knew where she was. Her husband and mistress were obviously suspects in the case, but they were apparently cleared of any immediate suspicion, and the case apparently just hit a dead end. Until 10 days later, the head waiter at a hotel in Yorkshire, some 80 miles away, contacted the police and said that a friendly South African guest by the name of Teresa Neal may very well be the missing writer. <gasps> Dun dun dun. I love plot twists. So her husband and the police went up to Yorkshire and Archibald sat down in the dining room of the hotel and waited and eventually saw Agatha walk in and take a seat at a separate table. And funnily enough, she was reading a newspaper on the front page of which was Agatha's disappearance. So Archibald approached her at her table and she was very confused. She apparently didn't recognize her husband of 12 years whatsoever. And after this incident, the two just went their separate ways. They got divorced, then later married others, and Agatha doesn't even mention this in her autobiography, which is kind of odd. The theories for this range from a big publicity stunt by either Agatha alone or by her husband as well, or maybe it was a post-traumatic mental breakdown by Agatha following the death of her mother and then news of her husband's affair and upcoming divorce. Or maybe it was some genuine attempt by Agatha just to escape for a little while, cut out the noise of everything, cut out people bothering her, cut out the drama, and she did it in the most appropriate way for her by staging a mystery disappearance fit for a character in one of her novels. It was a pretty cool little story, but it seems like this is one of Agatha's only mysteries that will never be solved. Altered State of Consciousness. Also known as Altered State of Mind, or Mind Alteration, or any variation of those words really. They refer to any conditions of the mind that is very unusual or unlike normal waking consciousness. Now this whole topic is kind of wild and it's very hard to pin down an exact cause or really exact outcomes or symptoms for this. The only thing that a lot of them really have in common is that they are non-standard or abnormal. For instance, these states can be brought on by drugs, hypnosis, meditation, traumatic experiences, chemical imbalances in the brain. Just all sorts of causes. And they manifest themselves in various ways too. From delusions to delirium to psychosis, anxiety, paranoia, fear, but also in positive ways as well, like a stronger, more formidable mind. As is normally the case with stuff like hypnosis or meditation, the mind is incredibly hard to figure out and to diagnose. There have obviously been cases of stuff like Buddhist monks setting themselves on fire and sitting there completely still in the lotus position without moving until they die, which is achieved by intense meditation and it's clearly an abnormal state of mind where they're essentially blocking out fear, pain, and just the natural instincts for their body to survive. And I mean, talk about an altered state of mind. I flinch when I touch a pan that's too hot. And then you have stuff like psychosomatic illnesses where it's essentially all in your mind, but it also manifests itself physically. It's kind of strange. So say on one hand, you have a physical symptom you fall over, hurt your knee, that is going to cause you pain and that's something that doctors can look at and say yes this is the cause for your pain. On the other hand you have stuff that is purely psychological so maybe you have anxiety that your arm is going to fall off because you saw it on a late night medical tv show or something so you start building up all this anxiety but there's no pain in your arm, there's no tingling, there's no physical symptoms. But psychosomatic illnesses are kind of strange. They can manifest themselves in actual pain like headaches, body aches, or feelings of being sick, or even stuff like ulcers. But the cause for them is basically all in your head. So if doctors were to look at your body and physical symptoms, they wouldn't really see a cause for any of these. And that is essentially the power of the mind. So no matter what you want to do in life, control your mind and you are basically already halfway there. Proceed with caution, eat your greens, stay hydrated, and exercise regularly. I don't know how this turned into a motivational entry, but there you go. Batman fights 
Dracula. This is a hilarious 1967 Filipino film written by Bert R. Mendoza, and it was in no way authorized by DC to be written or produced. The story goes like this. There is a mad scientist called Dr. Zorba who is repeatedly defeated by Batman. It's just embarrassing. So as mad scientists tend to do, he pulls a wild card and resurrects Count Dracula, even finding a way to control Drac, making him stronger and making him immune to the things that would normally harm him, like crosses and holy water. So Dracula sneaks into the Batcave and attacks Batman. Batman then attempts to use a cross and holy water on Dracula, but of course neither of them work on him. And I just love how Batman just happens to have a cross and holy water on him, because fucking of course he does, he's Batman. Dracula knocks Batman out, and when he wakes up, his trusty butler Turco, who is definitely not Alfred, I mean they used Batman already, why not just use Alfred as well. But anyway, Turco tends to Batman's injuries, and then Batman and his trusty sidekick Rubin, who is totally not Robin. I don't know why you would even think that. They are clearly two separate people. Anyway, he and Rubin turn Dracula against Zorba, killing him. And the movie just ends with Batman lecturing a caged Dracula in the Batcave about justice. Bravo. Just a mwah of a film. As I said, the film was never authorized by DC, and sadly it is now thought to be lost to the sands of time. But honestly, this would be a great one to watch on a rainy autumn day. The Bat Squatch is this terrifying creature. It sort of resembles a flying primate. It looks a bit like a falcon crossed with a bat, crossed with an ape, with a wolf. It was spotted in the 1980s near Mount St. Helen, and obviously its name is a crossover of Bat and Sasquatch. Very clever. Another sighting was by a man named Brian Canfield in 1994. This was in Washington, and he was driving home when his truck suddenly died. He said a large creature landed down in front of him, human-like, nine feet tall, with huge bat-like wings and blue fur. Pretty creepy, as I was always terrified of Jeepers Creepers when I was a kid, but I am pretty far from Washington, and I don't know how well the Bat Squatch can fly over the Atlantic, so I should be fine. The Bear Brook Jane Doe is a reference to the sad and shocking case of the Bear Brook murders in the 1970s. Four victims were killed and were found either partially or fully skeletonized. There was Merrilise Honeychurch, 24, and her two daughters, who were seven years old and 11 months old respectively, which is just incredible. Incredibly tragic. These two girls were identified as Marilise's daughters, but the third girl, who was thought to be between two and four years old, never was. She died likely sometime between 1978 and 1981, and was confirmed through DNA to be the daughter of Terry Rasmussen, who was the main suspect in this case. I don't know how she was confirmed to be his daughter but still unidentified, but maybe she was born and never registered, so they never knew her exact age or name or anything like that. I think that's likely what happened. Terry was later convicted of murdering his wife, Yoon Soon, in 2002 and died in prison eight years later. So he was likely the culprit behind these sick killings, but we'll never know for sure. And who the little girl was and what her name was will likely remain a mystery. Ben Nevis screams. So Ben Nevis is a mountain. In fact, the tallest mountain in Scotland. So as humans and goats tend to do, they climb it. And it is is a fairly popular mountain to climb for those with adventurous bones and souls. So let me take you to 2015, when producer Chris Slight was on his winter climb of Ben Nevis. He and a few other climbers were climbing a route called the Combe Gully, a beautiful but terrifying route up the mountain. The ice was perfect for climbing, everything was going well, until Christopher heard a faint scream. It was muffled at first and he wasn't sure exactly what he heard, so he stopped what he was doing and listened more closely. And not long after, he heard another scream, but this time more clearly. It was, as he described it, blood curdling in the realist sense. He described it as if the person screaming had just witnessed one of their loved ones fall to their death. So much 
much pain, so much loss, so much emotion. This terrified Christopher, as at the time he was just hanging on a small metal hook. And this scream brought him back to reality. It was no longer just a fun mountain climb with some friends. The very real possibility of him falling and dying up here flooded his mind. And that is to say nothing of the genuine concern and worry he felt for whoever was screaming. There was no way down from where he was, so him and his fellow climbers had to continue upwards. They shortly made their way up to the top of the plateau, but there was just eerie silence. And from then onwards, there was no more screams, no more news of what had actually happened, and other climbers not in Christopher's group had actually abseiled down from where they were to check out the screams, but they found no one and no evidence of what happened. And the police said that there was no reports of any missing persons, or any reports of deaths or injuries or accidents. So a pretty terrifying one to be up that high hanging off a metal hook on the side of a mountain, all while hearing the worst, most blood-curdling scream that you have heard in your life. But with no body, no evidence, no incident, accident, or missing person, it seems like where and who those screams came from will forever remain a mystery. So without further ado, grab a drink. My choice today is honey and lemon tea. And join me as we explore the unsolved mystery iceberg. So to start off with, we have the black demon, which isn't a demon, but it is black. So they got half of it right. This is a rumored huge black shark that is said to inhabit an area just off the coast of Mexico. There have been multiple sightings of this creature and it is said to be up to 60 feet in length and over a hundred thousand pounds in weight. Now people who have seen this creature, mostly fishermen, said that the black demon kind of resembles a great white shark, only much, much larger and of a darker coloration, hence the name Black Demon. The largest great white sharks grow to be around 20 feet in length, which would make the Black Demon roughly three times that size. It was first spotted in 2008, and theories say that it could be a megalodon, which was this huge chunk of a beast shark that was thought to have gone extinct roughly two million years ago. We know the megalodons existed due to the teeth that we have found, which are over seven inches in length, which is a fucking huge tooth. <laughs> And the megalodon was so big that it could swallow an entire elephant whole. I mean, I don't know what an elephant would be doing in the middle of the ocean, but at that point, it's kind of the elephant's fault. Just don't go near the ocean and you'll be fine. So yeah, these things were flipping huge. Sorry for the harsh language. But whether the black demon is a mutant great white shark, a lone surviving megalodon, or just a thing of legends, we may never know. The blood house at Fountain Drive was a terrifying event. So let me take you back to 1987, to a house on Fountain Drive, Atlanta, Georgia. Minnie Winston, 77, and her husband, Willie, were minding their own business and winding down for the night, when Minnie, after having a bath, stepped out of her bathtub, and she stepped right into a puddle of blood. She was completely shocked, as anyone would be, but apparently she stayed mostly calm, which I think if you're pushing on 80 years old, I don't know if anything terrifies you anymore. But she stepped out into this puddle of blood and assumed that maybe her husband had had an accident or something like that. So she quickly left the bathroom to go check on her husband. But as she got out into the hallway, what she saw there completely froze her. The entire hallway was covered in blood. From the baseboards, the walls, the ceiling, with even large droplets seemingly bubbling up through the floor. As I said, she stood there in in shock when suddenly a large explosion of blood came up from the floor. Almost like, as they described it, an artery of the house had been cut. And, as we all know, houses do not have arteries. So this was very strange. And this, of course, further spread blood around the hallway. Minnie rushed into her husband's room, checked that he was okay, woke him up, and then called the police. Now, the police that were first called probably had the same thoughts that you or I would have. Blood coming from the the walls and the floor, and there's no body, something doesn't quite add up here. There were no bodies found on the property. Minnie and her husband were both uninjured and perfectly fine. The house's alarm was set and hadn't gone off all night, so no one could have really snuck in and planted this blood somehow. But that's if it was really 
the blood, which is a fairly sensible question to ask at this point. Could it have been some rusty liquid, some thin or latex paint or something? These certainly seem more plausible than actual blood coming from the walls. So they took some of this liquid, did tests on it, and it actually came back as being human blood. Even stranger, it was O-type blood, and Minnie and Willie were both of A-type blood, which means it absolutely couldn't have been their blood. They checked national blood banks to see if any blood had gone missing, but there was no missing blood or thefts reported. And as well as looking into natural explanations for this, i.e. someone planting the blood there or some sort of hoax or something, they also looked into supernatural explanations. And the start of this was to look into the history of the home. So 40 years ago, the racial tensions of the area, and you could argue of America as a whole, were kind of at an all-time high. And the resident of the home at the time, a black man named Albert Thompson, was involved in a car crash caused primarily by a white truck driver. It was the truck driver's fault for the most part, and the truck driver didn't really sustain any injuries, but Thompson suffered pretty bad internal bleeding, and was sent from the hospital to his home on Fountain Drive to recover. And so, that's basically where they were left at. Was this a prank by someone completely unrelated? Was it a form of political or moral activism, possibly in relation to the racial injustices that the area and the home faced? Was it a hoax by a third party, or possibly including the elderly couple? Or was it perhaps the ghost of Albert Thompson, bleeding through the house, as he himself had bled inside the house many years ago? Your guess is as good as mine, and I'm a little disappointed to see that Aliens isn't one of these options, even though I wrote these options. Brandon Embry was a former member of the US Navy, who was found unconscious in his home in Seattle in 2019. When police arrived at the scene, the apartment was, for lack of a better word, destroyed. It didn't just look messy, it looked like someone had absolutely ransacked the place. The bedroom was a mess, the nightstand was knocked over, stuff was thrown into piles, old boxes were stacked up, and the bathroom was absolutely soaked, with the toilet lid actually being ripped off and the porcelain tank smashed in two. So in regards to Brandon's health, he had some problems with his testosterone levels, and so he had some injections to boost it, which often led to him feeling hot or dizzy. But Brandon was found unconscious, leant over a box in his apartment, covered in blood. His bed had bloodstains on, his entire room had bloodstains all over it, and Brandon sadly died before regaining consciousness. Brandon often didn't feel too well because of the treatments that he was going through, but that didn't explain the large amount of blood found. And by his family's admittance, he wasn't the cleanest, most organized of people, but that didn't explain the utter destruction and sheer chaos of the scene. This case was never solved, and whether it was a purely natural, unfortunate death, or a murder covered up by who knows who, possibly ransacking the place in order to try and find something, valuable goods, maybe some secrets from the Navy that he shouldn't have had. It's a little unclear, and it doesn't look likely that we will ever find the answer. The Cape Ripper was an unidentified serial killer who killed 19 women, mostly sex workers, between 1992 and 1996 in Cape Town, South Africa. Whoever this was, was somewhat clever about the way they killed their victims, and about how and where they disposed of them. He would kill his victims mostly through strangulation, using some sort of ligature and would only attack his victims on rainy nights, so that after he dumped the body, the rain would wash away some of the evidence and pretty much all of the tire tracks. He would drive up, pick up these women, strip them, get them to sit on his lap, and then strangle them to death. He would then dump the bodies in various different locations, and put the bodies in different positions. Some he would leave in shallow graves, some he would just dump there and cover up, and some he wouldn't cover at all. He would leave some of them clothed, some of them naked, some of them semi-naked, some he would just dump out of his vehicle, and some he would position to look like they had been assaulted. But there was never any male bodily fluids, shall we say, found at the scenes 
or on the bodies. And there was no evidence to show that any of the women had been forcibly assaulted. So one theory was that whoever this man was, maybe he was sexually inept and suffered from erectile dysfunction. Because there wasn't really a pattern with how the bodies were left or where they were left, it took quite a while to actually link all of the killings and bodies to one common serial killer. But once the killings were linked, the bodies just kept piling up. And in 1996, the final victim, 16-year-old Teresa Vandevint, was found half-naked, covered in branches, near a footpath. She was the last and youngest victim. One of the victims, strangely, was found with a coke bottle inside of her you-know-what. And one of the prostitutes working in the area told police that one of her clients had a fantasy about inserting a coke bottle into a woman's you-know-what. So, who was this client of hers? He was an elderly, unemployed man who lived in a caravan nearby. He had erectile dysfunction and often hung around prostitutes. So it's starting to sound like he's maybe our guy? He drove a pickup truck, which was similar to the one that was seen near one of the killings. His wife said he often disappeared for hours at a time with no explanation as to where he was. And he said that he frequently suffered from blackouts and amnesia. So yeah, pretty strong, but circumstantial evidence at this point. In a police interview, he said that he could have killed the women. He didn't know, as he had no recollection or memory of those times and dates. He was released, and then later actually called the police anonymously, saying that once his truck was in working order again, that more women would be killed. Like, what? The police, of course, recorded this call and just matched the voice with the voice of the old man, so he was actually arrested and charged with the death of the 16-year-old victim, with her fingerprints actually being found in his truck. But these fingerprints were later found to have actually been planted by the police. And so, because of this shortcut they tried to take, essentially, they were forced to release this man, and due to a lack of evidence overall, he is, to this day, a free man. Which is just insane. Chalice Paul was this 33-year-old fairly attractive actress who went missing in 1981 just before her upcoming role in a Burt Reynolds film, of all things. She was married to a man named John Paul Sr., who we actually covered in an earlier entry in this iceberg. If you remember, a woman named Colleen Wood went missing while out in the Florida Keys with her husband at the time, John Paul Sr. This was 20 years or so after the disappearance of Chalice Paul, and and it was much in the same manner. John Paul basically said to Chalice, look, before you head out for your role for this film, let's just go out to the Florida Keys for something like our second honeymoon. And so she obliged. But according to John, when they got there, she just up and left without telling him. And he didn't even bother to report his missing wife like ever. He literally never reported her missing. It took her family finding out about her disappearance to report her missing over a year later. And around this time, John was involved in a big drug smuggling operation and later shot and tried to kill one of his accomplices to potentially avoid him testifying against John in court. The guy ended up living and so John Paul was charged and convicted of attempted murder and sentenced to 25 years in prison, of which he served around 12 years. Then, shortly after his release, he met Colleen Wood, and shortly after they met, she went missing as well. After this, he fled the country and was never seen again. He was never charged or convicted for the disappearances of either Colleen Wood or Chalice Paul, and due to John now being in his 80s, if he even is still alive, it is unlikely that he will ever be brought to justice. But rest in peace, Colleen and Chalice. Charles Rogers was a very very strange case. He was previously a naval officer and pilot who had done work for various oil drilling companies over the years. He was highly intelligent, speaking seven languages, and having a special interest in complex electronics, including radios. So that's basically his background, and as to his current situation, he was kind of a recluse, living in the same home as his two elderly parents, and apparently communicating with them by pushing notes 
notes underneath their door. So yeah, kind of strange. He often kept to himself and a lot of the neighbors didn't even know that he lived there as he used to leave before it got bright and come back well after it got dark. So one day the police happened to come around for a wellness check due to someone reporting that the elderly mother of the house hadn't returned their phone calls in a few days. And when the police came and did a search of the house, they found the heads and body parts of the elderly couple dismembered, somewhat drained of blood and stacked up in the family refrigerator. But Charles was nowhere to be found. The organs were cut up and flushed down the toilet. The blood and mess had been very well cleaned up by apparently someone who knew what they were doing and things just get stranger from here. Charles was thought to have some connections with intelligence officers and was in fact believed by some to be a secret CIA operative who was heavily involved in the assassination of President JFK which is like a lot to take in. Now, as you all know, this is an Unsolved Mysteries iceberg, but there are quite a few interesting and dark conspiracy theories that I would absolutely love to explore through a conspiracy theory iceberg. So let me know in the comments below if this is something you would like to see, possibly after this one is finished, possibly while I'm doing this one. I haven't really fully decided on that yet, but for me, it would be a very, very cool and dark and mysterious thing to cover. If that's something you all would like to see. And that was basically where this case ended. Charles was never found and 10 years later he was declared legally dead in absentia. The case was never solved and Charles to this day remains the main witness and the main suspect. Now as to what actually happened, in my eyes there are quite a few possibilities. This is not an exhaustive list by any means, but it's just a few of the more plausible ones I thought of while researching this case. So Charles could have just gone mad from CIA experiments. The CIA is well known for some of their mental experiments like MK Ultra, so it's not a stretch to think that maybe Charles was involved in an experiment of some kind and just went absolutely loopy and murdered and dismembered his parents. And because he was a very intelligent individual, he was able to afterwards escape and maybe change his name or flee the country or something like that. Or he was potentially killed by the CIA due to either having knowledge that he shouldn't have done from the CIA or in regards to the assassination of JFK. And his parents were killed either because they were witnesses to whatever happened or as a way to paint Charles as a crazy guy or in a bad light of some kind. Or the CIA wanted him to run away or relocate or something and his parents were the only thing holding him to that area. So they got rid of his only reason to stay there and he went and did whatever the CIA wanted him to do. There are a ton of hypothetical possibilities possibilities for this one, as there's not too much evidence in any one particular direction. It's a super interesting and dark case that I think is unlikely to ever be solved, unless we maybe get access to some super secret CIA files or something. But who knows? Just a quick reminder from your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man to tap the like button if you are liking the video and hit the subscribe and bell icons if you'd like to see more like this in the future. The fate of the world depends on it. The Codex Giga, Latin for the giant book, is the largest surviving medieval illuminated manuscript in the world. Illuminated in this context basically just means it's not a plain text manuscript. It's got embellishments and colorful designs and drawings and stuff like that. And the pages of this book are absolutely huge. I mean, just look at the size of these things. And it is estimated that to write all of the text in this book, and that's just the text alone without any of the colors or embellishments or drawings or illustrations, would take upwards of 20 years. It was made in the 13th century in what is now the modern day Czech Republic, and it was written mostly in Latin. It contains the complete Vulgate Bible, or Latin Bible, as well as many other popular works, such as Isidore's of Seville's Encyclopedia Etymologiae, and the Chronicle of Cosmas of Prague. I mentioned this earlier, but the sizes of these pages are absolutely huge, and the designs and drawings and colours and everything is just a work of art and beauty. The codex is bound up with wooden boards on either side, and covered in leather, metal guards, fittings, and ornaments, and is thought to be made from the skin of roughly 160 dolphins. Sorry, not dolphins, 
donkeys. Dolphins would be absurd, but 160 donkeys being killed and skinned just for this book is a pretty gruesome thought. The codex contains 320 sheets or pages, and the look and the feel of the entire book is apparently quite unified. The mannerisms of whoever wrote the book didn't really seem to change over the many, many years that it was written, which is quite impressive when you think how much you've personally changed, even in the last year, let alone 5, 10, 15, or 20 years in the past. And this has led to some people believing that it was written in a much shorter time frame, not of 20 or more years, but in fact in a single night. So this codex is often also known as the Devil's Bible, and this is due in part to this entire sheet in the codex being dedicated to this intricate, colourful, creative illustration of the devil himself, and the legend surrounding the codex and its creation. So the legend goes that around the time that the book was created, there was a monk who broke his monastic vows, and so was sentenced to be walled up alive, which is horrifying, and to avoid this terrible death, he promised in one night to write an entire book that would glorify the monastery forever, and would include all of human knowledge. They entertained his promise as the last wish of a doomed man, and as it got towards midnight, the monk got so desperate that he prayed to the devil for help. And, in exchange for his soul, the devil obliged to help this monk, with, of course, the monk dedicating an entire page to the devil. That's how the legend goes, anyway. And it is an interesting thought, to be sure. The codex over the years eventually made its way to Rudolf II of Prague, and after the Thirty Year War, the Swedes took the codex back to Sweden as some of their loot, and it is now preserved and displayed in the National Library of Sweden in Stockholm. A a truly cool and magnificent codex that, like many things in the ancient world, has a level of craftsmanship and dedication not really seen in today's day and age. Colin Michael Good was a 51-year-old recluse who lived in a secluded home on the Great Barrier Island in New Zealand. He was a former farmer and known cannabis grower, and was found dead on his bed with his right hand missing in 1999. His cause of death was found to be inconclusive. I mean, maybe it's something to do with his fucking hand being chopped off. But it was ruled as definitely a homicide, as chopping off your own hand isn't something people typically do. I mean, not normally, anyway. The police found two guns on the property, but said that he didn't have any gunshot wounds, so that wasn't the cause of death. And eight years ago, Colin reported that he had been attacked and robbed in his own home by members of the Mongol mob who took from him a kilo of cannabis and around 1200 New Zealand dollars. Police Say that they have tried everything to get to the bottom of this case, but due to the lack of evidence and everything surrounding it, they say they have essentially gotten as far as they can get unless new evidence turns up. But when drugs and hand chopping offs are involved, I think you can put gangs and mobs and mafias up there near the top of the suspect list. Coral Castle. So this was or is a really cool castle or attraction made originally in the 1920s Florida by a Latvian immigrant named Edward Lee Skalnan. He was 26 years old in Latvia and planned to marry the 16 year old Agnes Skufst when just one day before the wedding she just said no and backed out. He then moved to America, became fairly wealthy through means like engineering and built this castle made from oolite limestone, which looks a little bit like coral, hence the name Coral Castle. When he was asked why he built it, he would often say that it was for his sweet 16, which is thought by most people to be a reference to his once bride-to-be, Agnes Scuffs. Edward was very, very secretive about this castle as it was being built over the years, and it is rumoured that he built the whole thing single-handedly, with the use of advanced levitation devices utilizing his own magnetic, electromagnetic, and possibly supernatural discoveries. Many of the stones in the castle are huge, immensely heavy, and massive, and are arranged with incredible skill and precision. None of the structures use mortar of any kind, and are held together with basically their own weight. There were many, many cool, intricate parts of the castle, including an eight-foot-tall gate that weighed eight tons and was balanced so 
perfectly and swiveled with such ease that a child could very easily push the gate open with a single finger. Edward never gave away any of his secrets and died with them in the 1950s. The gate did eventually start to get jammed, but it was a whole 30 years after Edward's death. They dismantled the gate with the help of six men and a 50 ton crane. And after dismantling it, they discovered the ingenuity with which Edward had built it. There was a large hole drilled down the center of the door with a metal shaft being passed through and the whole thing was resting on a large truck bearing. This kept the gate perfectly balanced over the years and allowed for its incredible ease of opening and closing. There are many, many more parts of the attraction like this gate scattered around the castle. An accurate sundial, a telescope, an obelisk, a barbecue, a water fountain and a two-story tall castle tower which Edward actually lived in. You can actually still visit the castle to this day as it is a fairly popular tourist attraction but just how he built it and why Edward Lee Scalnan dedicated his life to this castle of mind-blowing intricacy and complexity is perhaps forever a complete mystery. The Count of Saint Germain was an incredibly fascinating and mysterious figure from the 1700s. He was a European traveler, adventurer, whatever he was, but he seemed to travel and roam quite a bit, especially throughout Europe. And he was fairly well known in high society at the time, due in part to his interests and achievements in a wide, wide range of topics. These include science, philosophy, alchemy, and the arts. As I said, he was a mysterious figure who went by many titles and names over the years, including but not limited to the Marquis of Montferrat, Comte Bellamare, Chevalier Schoening, Count Weldon, Comte Soltikoff, Manuel Doria, Graf Sarogi, and Prince Ragoshi. And Prince Dragovsky. And sorry if I mispronounce some of those names. They are from many, many languages and I speak none of them. He was also said to make some absurd claims, like being 500 years old, which led to him being dubbed by some as the Wonder Man and He Who Does Not Die and Knows Everything, which is a bold title to have. Now, we don't know for sure who exactly he was or where he came from, which just adds to the mystery of it all. Although towards the end of his life, he apparently confided in someone and claimed to be a son of Prince Francis II Rakovsky of Transylvania. He composed musical pieces, was able to stand toe to toe with other renowned scientists, philosophers, and noblemen. He spoke several languages and was called by some the greatest philosopher who ever lived, which again is a bold claim. He was arrested in London at one point on suspicion of espionage, and it was remarked about him. The other day they seized an odd man who goes by the name of Count Saint Germain. He has been here two years and will not tell who he is or whence, but professes two wonderful things. The first, that he does not go by his right name, and the second, that he has never had any dealings with any woman, nay, nor with any sucker. Danium. He sings, plays on the violin wonderfully, composes, is mad, and not very sensible. He is called an Italian, a Spaniard, a Pole, somebody that married a great fortune in Mexico, and ran away with her jewels to Constantinople. A priest, a fiddler, a vast nobleman, the Prince of Wales has had an unsatiated curiosity about him, but in vain. He died at the age of 88 on his property, and no one ever really did confirm who he was or where he came from. So yeah, bit of a strange individual, but a cool one nonetheless. So grab a drink. My choice today is Moroccan mint tea and join me as we explore the unsolved mystery iceberg. Now to start off with, we have Daniel Morgan. To paint the scene, we need to take a trip back to 1987, London, England. So it's 1987, Whitney Houston and Rick Astley are at the top of the charts with songs that I would play for you, but I don't have the license, unfortunately. So you can just hum along. <laughs> ba -da -ba -da -ba 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 
It was in that year of 1987 that Daniel Morgan, a private investigator, was killed with an axe in the car park of a pub in Sydenham. He was a private investigator for Southern Investigations, which was the company that he founded along with his business partner, Jonathan Rees. So on this day, Daniel, although he was married, was actually having an affair with a woman called Margaret Harrison. He met her earlier in the day at a wine bar. Then he made his way to the Gold Golden Lion Pub to have a drink with his partner and business partner, Reese. He had a few drinks, left the pub, and was later found lying in the car park, face up with an axe embedded in his skull, which is a pretty gruesome way to go. His watch had been stolen, but not his wallet, strangely, or the large amount of cash that was actually sitting in his jacket pocket at the time. So the motive for killing him doesn't really seem to be monetary, and it doesn't, at least to me, seem like a random mugging or attack of some kind. This seemed very targeted. And I don't think muggers are just walking around the streets carrying an axe on them. It seems really that because Daniel Morgan was an investigator, that he was killed likely probably because of some information that he had. So the obvious next question is what information did Daniel have? Well, when he was found, the pockets of his trousers were torn open and some notes that he was seen earlier writing were not found on his body. So the plot thickens. Whatever Daniel was writing in these notes, it seems probably likely that whoever killed him didn't want anyone to know what was in these notes. Perhaps it was regarding one of his recent cases or something that he had seen or heard in the last few days. Although it could have been a general cover-up, as in the killer didn't know what was on the papers, but just in case there was some sort of incriminating evidence on there, the killer took them from Daniel's body. That could have been the case. Now, during the investigation around Daniel's murder, there was a bunch of witness and informant testimony that was actually unable to be used in court for whatever reason, which is partly why no one was convicted for his murder. But the testimony does give us some interesting backstory into what maybe likely could have happened and the reasons behind it and the people involved. Daniel had many, many disagreements, sometimes quite aggressive disagreements with his business partner, Reese, And Reese had apparently told a third party that he had friends slash police officers at the Catford police station who were willing to murder Daniel or at least have his murder arranged as a favor or job of sorts to Reese. which those are some pretty dedicated friends. And after Daniel's death, a man named Sid Fillery would replace Daniel as Reese's partner. So who was Sid Fillery? Detective Detective Sergeant Sid Fillery was actually a member of the police force and was, believe it or not, assigned to Daniel's murder case. But at the time, he didn't reveal to his superiors that he had been working unofficially for Southern Investigations or that he was in line to replace Daniel after his death. So obviously there seems to be some conflict of interests here and being a major suspect in your own case is clearly intentionally or unintentionally some form of corruption. So after the investigation started, Sid, Reese, Reese's brothers-in-law, and a few police officers at the police station were arrested on suspicion of Daniel's murder. But as I said earlier, they were all eventually released, mostly partly due to lack of evidence. Sid, after Daniel's murder, did in fact leave the police station and go to join Southern Investigations as a lead investigator. And he was alleged during Daniel's murder case to have tampered with some of the evidence and interfered with some of the witnesses during the inquiry. So, yeah. In the summer of that same year, 1987, an acquaintance of Daniel, Detective Constable Alan Holmes, which is an awesome surname for a detective, he was found to have ended himself in very mysterious, suspicious circumstances. So, obviously, a question is raised. What did Holmes know in all of this? Did he perhaps know what Daniel originally knew? Or did he know something about Daniel's death? And was he, in fact, killed to cover this whole thing? 
nothing up. Since the initial murder, there were several other investigations involving the murder itself, but also the people and characters involved in the murder and investigation. And one of these, which took place in December of 2000, found Reese, the business partner, guilty of conspiring to plant cocaine on an innocent woman in order to discredit her from a child custody battle, which is just fucking nuts by the way. And he was sentenced to seven years for attempting to pervert the course of justice. So yeah, not the most honest, moral, trustworthy of individuals. The entire case ties in murder, corruption, bribery, drug trafficking, and many, many more illegal and immoral activities. And sadly, Daniel caught in the middle of it all, ended up paying the ultimate price. And almost 40 years later, his death remains un solved. Dark fluid is a super interesting theory that combines two scientific phenomena together. These two phenomena we have actually covered in previous episodes, and they are dark matter and dark energy. And the dark fluid theory says that these two things aren't really separate things, but rather they're just different expressions of the same single phenomena, that being dark fluid. At galactic scales, dark fluid behaves like dark matter, increasing the mass and gravity within the galaxy, and basically holding the whole thing together. And at larger scales, this dark fluid behaves like dark energy, which is essentially responsible for pushing the galaxies away from each other at a faster rate than we would expect. The main idea in this theory is that when dark fluid is in the presence of regular matter, such as in galaxies, dark fluid slows down, clumps together, and this clumping together then attracts more dark fluid. And because there's more dark fluid, there is more mass. And because there's more mass, there's more gravity. So we get the effects that we currently attribute to dark matter. Then, where there is relatively little matter, like far out in space or the voids between galaxies, this dark fluid, for lack of a better word, relaxes. And because it relaxes, it acquires negative pressure, which essentially turns its gravity into a repulsive force, acting like what we observe as dark energy. This theory goes a lot deeper into what it predicts and how it works, but this, for the most part, is the gist of it. And if you ask me, it's a pretty cool theory that may very likely be true. The Death Crawler. Now I'll just say that if you don't like creepy crawlies, but they died out roughly 300. But first, here is a riddle. What has 46 legs, two thumbs, and doesn't give a damn? The answer? giant killer centipedes from the Amazon rainforest. Minus the two thumbs, that clue was a red herring. These giant centipedes grow to be around 10 to 12 inches in length, with some of the longest being measured up to 18 inches in length, and they are known as Amazonian giant centipedes, or Peruvian giant yellow leg centipedes. They are, as far as we know, the largest living centipedes in today's age. But what about yesterday's age? Or more specifically, three hundred million years ago's age. Well, the largest centipede on record ever is the Euphorbia, which grew to around 39 inches in length, roughly three to four times the current largest centipede, which is absolutely terrifying and insane. But the Arthropleura, which is a close relative to the centipede, reached an insane eight and a half feet in length, or a hundred and two inches. Or did they? Yeah, they did. Or did they? There are rumors and tales around areas in South America that these long suspected extinct creatures did in fact survive through the ages in small numbers deep within the unexplored regions of the Amazon. And since the bite of the current largest centipede has been likened to a gunshot or broken bone, and is able to induce anaphylactic shocks and actually kill small children, if the ancient Arthropleura did survive to this day, their bites and venom could very well have the potential to kill a fully grown human. And these ancient creatures, said to be alive to this very day, are known as death crawlers. If you are enjoying 
enjoying this video, guys. I do weekly videos exploring dark, mysterious, or fascinating things. So, if that sounds like your cup of tea, hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any of the future videos. And tip the like button just so I know that you guys are enjoying this and would like to see more. Let me know what you're drinking in the comments below. And for now, let's get back to the video. Devil's Footprints. This was a phenomenon that occurred in 1855 February in Devon, England. After a particularly heavy snowfall, there were these little markings or footprints found in the snow by many, many people over a distance of around 40 to 100 miles. A lot of these markings or footprints had the appearance of a cloven hoof, which is the type of feet that the devil is purported to have, hence the devil's footprints. These ranged from about yay big to about yay bigger and the distance apart also varied depending on the size of the footprint which is not unreasonable if the devil can tempt you into eating an entire box of donuts then he can sure as hell if you'll pardon the pun change the size of his body and feet just makes logical sense. These markings were found in over 30 locations across Devon and Dorset, and the placements of these prints was sometimes very strange. They were found running over fields, running through houses and hay bales and sheds. They were found on top of roofs and high walls, and leading up to and exiting drain pipes, some of which were as small as four inches. So that's a really tiny devil. There was very limited evidence for this occurrence, as it was only really brought to everyone's attention in the 1950s. Someone apparently discovered this event and published an article looking for more evidence and information about it, and this resulted in the discovery of a bunch of papers by a vicar of a local church at the time in the 1850s, who was Reverend H.T. Ellicombe. These papers included letters to the vicar from various friends friends and acquaintances around Devon and Dorset that apparently reported the appearance of these footprints. So yeah, a very strange occurrence to say the least. Theories for these prints range from a stray experimental balloon that was released and dragged a metal tie behind it, making these markings in the snow as it went by, which to me honestly seems less likely than the devil himself making these footprints. And other theories say it was simply donkeys or other hooved animals, or badgers, wood mice, even kangaroos. Yes, kangaroos. And it's obviously very hard, in fact impossible, to observe and get evidence of these footprints directly, as it was so long ago, and the only actual evidence we have of it are people's descriptions and accounts of them. So, whether they marked the path of the actual devil, roaming around Devon in the dead of winter, lost in the snow, looking for his next victim, or whether they are simply the markings of wild animals. I will let you decide. Diana Hunter of Bus Drivers. So this was a series of shootings that took place in Juarez, Mexico in 2013. Now to say that Juarez is fairly violent is perhaps putting it a bit lightly. So it's maybe not so surprising that these attacks took place here. On August 28th, a woman boarded the number four bus while it was on its quiet route through Juarez. She was wearing a blonde wig, a hat, a plaid shirt, went and sat at the back of the bus for roughly 15 minutes, and then as she was getting up to leave, she walked by the bus driver, pulled out a gun, and shot him dead. She then got off the bus and vanished into the night. 24 hours later, on the exact same bus route, she again boarded a bus, and as she was leaving, she shot and killed another bus driver. So this was obviously terrifying for any bus drivers, and especially for those working in the city of Juarez, and especially, especially for those on that particular route. Who was this woman? Why was she seemingly randomly shooting bus drivers? And what, if anything, could be done to stop her? These were answered in part when a news gossip site, La Polaca, received an email shortly afterwards, allegedly from the killer. And it read, You think because we are women, we are weak. And that may be true, but only up to a point. Because even though we have nobody to defend us, and we have to work long hours until late into the night to earn a living for our families, we can no longer be silent in the face of these acts that enrage us. We are victims of sexual 
sexual violence from bus drivers working the Maquila night shifts here in Juarez. And although a lot of people know about the things we've suffered, nobody defends us, nor does anything to protect us. That's why I am an instrument that will take revenge for many women. For we are seen as weak, but in reality we are not. We are brave, and if we don't get respect, we will earn that respect with our own hands. We, the women of Juarez, are strong. Diana, hunter of bus drivers. So a pretty chilling email to read, especially if you were a bus driver in Juarez at the time. Diana was never caught or identified and got away with two murders in 24 hours, done right out in the open with a shoddy, basically non-existent disguise. And the police were apparently quite active in their search for Diana, more active some have pointed out than in their search for the problems that Diana faced, such as all the alleged female assault cases, which is perhaps the whole reason that Diana did this in the first place, but they never did find her. So was Diana justified in what she did? I don't know. Let me know what you think in the comments below. The story of Dino Bravo was a very tragic tale. He was a professional wrestler who started in the 1970s with the WWF, now called the WWE. He was essentially pushed out of the wrestling business and was eventually murdered as a result. He started his career off very strong in the 1970s and worked in the industry in some form or another all the way up until the 1990s. And back then the WWF was really the only wrestling game in town and so if they didn't want you you were kind of screwed. He tried to mix up his image and his character to stay fresh. He dyed his hair blonde but none of it really worked and the owners and managers of the WWF made it clear that the character of Dino Bravo was no longer wanted. Adolfo Bresciano whose wrestling name was Dino Bravo, had been in wrestling for pretty much his entire life. And now, at the age of 44, he didn't really have the knowledge or passion to do anything else, which is what made this ousting from the industry especially brutal. But he did have a particular line of work that he didn't often talk about, and he wasn't too proud of, and that was through his mafia family connections. He had often said in the past that he knew he could make a fairly decent amount of money through crime though he never really liked the idea of it. But after being kicked out of the wrestling industry, he felt like he had no choice. So he used his family mafia connections to set up a cigarette smuggling operation in Canada, and he did fairly well for himself during this time period. The problem was, with most things where there is money to be made, there are also enemies to be made, and Dino made his fair share of both. And so after running this operation for just a year, or so, and after a few disagreements and altercations with some other players in the game, Dino was found by his wife one March night, lying on his couch with 11 shots in his head and body. There were also some reports that said that the shooter had tried to shoot a smiley face shape with the bullet holes in Dino, which was pretty messed up and weird, and due to the fact that Dino was shot from behind, and that there was no signs of forced entry in the home, it was thought that Dino probably knew his killer as he was likely sitting there on the couch watching a game or something with someone he trusted watching it with him. Whoever this person was maybe got up to grab a beer from the kitchen and while he was behind Dino you know what happened. But the investigations didn't really go anywhere and so 30 years later this case still remains unsolved. Dolce Maria Alaves was a five-year-old girl who went missing in New Jersey 2019. She and her brother were playing on the swings in a playground while her mother was nearby in her car scratching off lottery tickets. This was around 4 or 5 in the evening and when Dolce's mother went to go and check on them, she found Dolce's brother by himself crying next to the swings. The police immediately did a sweeping search of the area and of the woods nearby but didn't really find anything from that search and the suspect was described as a light-skinned Hispanic man who was roughly 5 foot 8 and driving a red van but 
but nothing came of that description or investigation either. And so Dolce to this day remains a missing person. The Dungaven Hooter is a terrifying, fearsome creature, described as a deadly alligator-like creature, with no mouth and instead abnormally large nostrils. I am not making this up, that's just what it is. It has short legs and a thick, powerful tail, and it waits until somebody stumbles by before knocking them on the head with its tail and jumping on their victim repeatedly until they die. And while enduring this, the person apparently produces gases that the Dungaven Hooter then breathes in through its giant nostrils. Don't look at me, that's just what they do. Also in the research I did for this creature, they are described as hiding in bushes with satanic cunning, which is just worded absolutely hilariously. These creatures were more popular in the 19th and 20th centuries, especially among lumberjack tales, and lived mainly in Maine and Michigan. L.C. Walker. On October 5th, 1928, the body of a 16-year-old girl was found in a disused quarry in Auckland, New Zealand. The body was that of L.C. Walker, who went missing five days ago over 200 miles away. There were no physical signs of violence or cause of death, though they later found evidence of a fractured skull, which may or may not be been her cause of death. But one thing was for certain, they ruled out unanimously the possibility that Elsie did this to herself. So, who was to blame for this horrific crime? Well, Elsie was living with her aunt and uncle at the time, and when Elsie went missing, so did the aunt and uncle's car. And the car was found just a few miles from where Elsie was found. But, here's the strange thing, Elsie couldn't drive. So, whoever drove her there likely killed her. Now we come to Elsie's cousin, 28-year-old William Alfred Bailey. He was looked at as the main suspect throughout this entire case, but in a bittersweet turn of events, he was actually hanged five years later for basically murdering a bunch of people. He was the only major suspect for this case, and he was killed before they could ever get the truth out of him. But looking at his track record, I think William may very well have been the guy. He was punished appropriately appropriately for the murders that he committed, but because her killer was never officially found, Elsie never got justice. And almost a hundred years later, the official culprit for her killer remains a mystery. Flying dinosaurs in North Carolina. So North Carolina, home of the Bigfoot, of lizard men, of the Lake Norman monster, all fantastic creatures. Like, really, they are. But are they as cool as flying dinosaurs? Yeah, I didn't think so. Over the years, there have been several reports of pterosaurs, pterodactyls, or flying dinosaurs being spotted in the skies of North Carolina, sometimes described as small dragons, sometimes as huge, black-winged, featherless creatures. Some professors have said that it's not impossible for these dinosaurs to still be alive, but it is highly unlikely. He said he'd rank it slightly more likely than living unicorns, but only slightly more likely. But I mean, what does he know? And who are you going to believe? Some nerd professor or the great citizens of the US of A? Long live pterosaurs. So grab a drink, my choice today is pumpkin spice coffee with cream, which is absolutely delicious by the way, and very seasonal. And join me as we explore the unsolved mystery iceberg. The Falcon Lake incident. Now this is honestly one of my favorite alien slash UFO encounters ever, depending on what you believe about it, which will all make sense in a little bit. So Stefan Mahalak was an industrial engineer based in Texas, and he often liked to head out into the wilderness around Falcon Lake to do stuff Stuff like prospecting and digging for quartz and silver and stuff like that. He was kind of an amateur miner or geologist, if you will, and this activity was more or less a hobby for him. Connecting to the wilderness, maybe finding a cool rock or something, every guy's dream. So in May of 1967, he's out here in the wilderness, all alone, near some quartz I suppose, when he was suddenly startled by some geese. Now as scary as geese are, for sure, they are not aliens or 
are they? I mean, that sounds like a conspiracy theory entry that I would love to get into, but not today. When he was startled, he looked up, the geese around him flew away, and he saw two cigar-shaped objects, glowing red, hovering about 45 meters away from him. One landed on a rock, and the other just kind of hovered nearby and then flew away, and Stefan thought assumed that these were just experimental US military crafts. So he sat back for a while and actually sketched them. After about half an hour, I guess curiosity got the best of him and he decided to approach the craft that was still there. He felt a warmth around the crafts, a smell of sulfur, and as he got closer, he could hear the sounds of motors and the hissing of air. <laughs> He saw a door open on the side of the craft, and when it opened, he saw these bright lights coming from inside of it, and said he could hear voices, but couldn't understand what they were saying. At this point, he shouted out, asking if the Yankee boys needed any help. Yankee boys meaning just because they were American, and Stefan was Polish-American. And if these were military crafts, they were most likely US military crafts, and so they were probably American. But as soon as he shouted this out, the muffled voices that he was hearing went completely silent. He tried asking again if they needed any help in Polish, in Russian, in German, but there was no response. So he moved closer and actually reached out a hand and touched the craft, and he felt that it was very, very hot, and the outside was built of a smooth metal all the way around, apparently, with no visible seams or joints on it. As he got closer to the craft, the lights inside just got brighter and brighter, eventually forcing him to wear his welding goggles that he normally used when he was Mining. He peeked inside and saw bright lights and panels, but no sign of life, humans or otherwise. So, a little hesitant, he stepped back and as soon as he did, the opening or door on the side of the craft slid shut. The craft then got louder and louder with the mechanical sounds, and he reached out a hand to touch the craft, and at this point it burnt through his glove. Then the craft began to spin round and slowly take off. Now, as he stood there watching the craft slowly take off, he noticed on the side of the craft a grid of holes of some kind. Maybe it was an outlet, maybe it was a vent or something. And just as the craft was taken off, Stefan was blasted in the chest by hot air or gas or something coming out of the grid. This blast was so powerful that it knocked him back onto his feet and set his shirt and hat on fire. The craft continued to whir around and take off into the sky and Stefan just ripped off his burning clothes and stumbled back through the forest to the motel that he was staying at, all the while disoriented, nauseated, and vomiting. He was eventually taken to hospital for the burns on his chest and stomach, which by this point had turned into raised up sores on his chest, in the actual grid pattern of the craft's vent, which looks kind of cool but kind of horrible at the same time, and for weeks after he suffered from diarrhea, blackouts, headaches and weight loss. So what the hell were these crafts and what really happened to Stefan that night? That's a good question. Well for years after the incident there was all sorts of attention and attraction on the family. There were visits to their home from police, the air force, the media, multiple government agencies and just random members of the public that either wanted a photograph, an interview, a signature or just some questions answered I guess. But this this attention on the family got really tiring really quickly. It even got to the point where there were multiple, multiple letters, phone calls, people camping out on their front lawn, and a little scarily, people following Stefan's son to school and asking him about the encounter. I mean, these people probably need hobbies if they have enough spare time to follow children to school and basically interrogate them. I don't know, maybe take up crocheting or something. And Stefan eventually said that he believed that he he should never have even spoken a word about this. But at the time of the incident, he said he wasn't really thinking about that. He felt that it was the right thing to do, it was the truthful thing to do, and that he needed to make everyone aware of this craft, so that if someone else was in the woods or wilderness like he was, and they encountered the craft, that they wouldn't walk up to it and get injured as he did. He was just being the kind, moral citizen. Stefan's son, Stan, was bullied in school for this, with Stefan himself 
himself being called crazy by many, many people, especially local people, but he never backed down from his story and never once changed it. He also never believed that this was an alien craft. He said that in his opinion there was no evidence for that, and he was a very logical and practical man, not believing things that he didn't have evidence for. He always considered this encounter and the crafts to be secret US military crafts, which I guess a UFO technically is. It's just an unidentified object that flies, so there's no aliens that are technically necessary. This UFO encounter even beats the Roswell encounter for myself and many others, as the Roswell encounter is still very, very shrouded in mystery, and the US government still to this day doesn't even recognize that anything out of the ordinary happened on that day in Roswell in 1947. But at Stefan's encounter site, they retrieved his burnt glove and shirt. There was a circle about 15 feet in diameter that was completely devoid of moss and vegetation, perhaps where the aircraft landed. There were soil samples and samples of Stefan's clothing that were tested, and they all came back as being highly radioactive. There was also metal melted into the cracks of the rocks that was found a year later and was also highly radioactive. So it seems like whatever the blast was, the ongoing symptoms of Stefan were at least caused by radiation poisoning. After being admitted to a hospital, Stefan was then sent to a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist came back and said that Stefan was a fellow who is very pragmatic, very down to earth, if you'll excuse the pun, and does not make up stories. Stefan's son, Stan, author of a book that actually covers this encounter, later said that if my dad did hoax this, remember we're talking about a blue collar industrial mechanic, if he did hoax it, then he was an absolute genius. And I personally absolutely agree. Which is why, for me, this is the best UFO encounter ever documented. Like, ever. Giant scuttles are these unknown, huge, giant squid-like creatures spotted in the Bahamas and the Caribbean. They roam out deep down in open waters and are said to attack ships and boats by getting one tentacle underneath the hull and another tentacle on top of the hull and then wrapping them together and forming some sort of a grip and then sinking or destroying the ship. Pretty scary way to go. Death by scuttle. One of these has never been captured, but they are said to be the real creatures behind the legendary Kraken. Scary stuff. If you are enjoying this video, I do weekly videos exploring dark, mysterious, fascinating, and interesting things. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you do not miss any new videos that I put out. Tip the like button if you are liking it so far, and let me know what you are drinking in the comments below. But Let's get back to the video. Gibby was a cancelled spin-off of iCarly for Nickelodeon. Gibby was this minor recurring character in iCarly, who was a bit of a weirdo, a bit of a dork, and he was set to receive a spin-off series in which he was just a massive goofball, I guess. The pilot script is basically Gibby getting sentenced to detention after his pet weasel bites his teacher on the butt. Yep, that's a good plotline. Then he works out a deal with the principal to work in the cafe cafeteria instead of going to detention. He then saves a bunch of kids from bullies, goes to hang out in this recreational center, and gets taken hostage by a bunch of burglars. The end. This and another spin-off of iCarly, Sam and Cat, were both proposed, both had pilots made, but Two pilots enter, one pilot leaves, and Gibby sadly didn't make the cut, and so was never renewed past its pilot episode. And maybe that's for the best. The Gill family. In 2002 Argentina, six members of the Gill family vanished into seemingly thin air without a trace. This was one of the more mysterious disappearances that has happened in recent years, and what exactly happened to the family still hasn't been uncovered over 20 years later. The whole family lived basically on a large ranch in obviously Argentina. They worked as landlords and basically took care of the ranch as a whole, doing a bunch of the minor jobs as well. And the owner of the ranch was a man named Alfonso Goyete, but we'll get into him a little bit later. On the night of January 12th, 2002, the whole family went to a nearby town to visit a friend. And this was the last time that the family was ever 
scene. Three months later, in April, Goyete reported to the relatives of the Gills, and then they later reported to the police that the Gills hadn't returned from their three-month vacation that Goyete had given them, which, can I just say, it sounds like a long-ass vacation to give. And so, after being reported missing, the search began. But it wasn't very easy or eventful, as there were no bodies, no real evidence of any kind, and it had been three months since they went missing, so the case was very cold. Ruben, the father, had apparently made phone calls to a woman in Rosaria, Argentina, just after they went missing, but police were unable to trace these calls, and a neighbor said that they had seen one of the family members, maybe riding on a horse shortly after they went missing, and that was kind of it. So yeah, not much evidence at all to go off. After years of investigation and coming up with nothing, the ranch was eventually raided, the floors were raised up, the wells were dug out, and the ranch was monitored with an echo sounder, which basically shoots echoes out through the ground to try and find holes in the soil, or disturbed soil. Disturbed as in moved, not disturbed as in haunted. As if it's been moved and there's holes around, maybe that indicates a grave of some sort, but there were no potential grave sites found, and the only blood found on the ranch didn't belong to the gills, though forensics say that over time the blood work may not be as reliable as they want it to be. There were psychologists brought in to do analyses essentially of the family, and they determined that they likely didn't run away or do anything more drastic to themselves, as the whole family seemed to be fairly well grounded and happy, at least mentally. But neighbors did say that the normally happy, very talkative Reuben, the father of the family, was oddly quiet and concerned just days before the disappearance. So did Reuben have some knowledge of what was going to happen, or was he just concerned about something else that may or may not be related to the disappearance? Over the years, the case has been opened and reopened various times. Multiple searches and investigations have been conducted, but nothing new has been uncovered and none of the gills have appeared in any work, home, or migration documents, so pretty strange. <laughs> Now, one thing I have to cover is the ranch's owner, Alfonso Goyete. Right at the very start of the investigation, he hinted that the family might have gone to live with relatives in Santa Fe, or might have migrated north in search of work, which to me is a bit of a weird stretch to say that they would do either of these things really without telling Goyete, as their entire livelihood seemed to be on this ranch. And he claimed that the family had left all of their possessions on the ranch, including money and and personal documents, and when relatives came to the house to check, they didn't find money, they didn't find documents, they just found the rooms empty, with the mattresses being burnt, which is somewhat very suspicious. And lastly, the fact that Goyete had given them three months vacation, when prior to this, the longest he had ever given them was just a week or two. So the more I read into this case, the more suspicious I get of Goyete. But unfortunately, we won't get any more information or a confession out of him, as he died in a car crash in 2016 at the age of 78. But whatever happened to the Gills, I hope they are at peace and happy, whether that's in this life or the next. The Graves of Old Swan was this creepy, weird, insane case where in the 1970s, there were plans to demolish an old school from the 1800s. This was in Old Swan, Liverpool, and in its place, they were to build two new state-of-the-art schools. So, the checks went through, the plans were made, and the demolition was started. But what they then found completely stopped everyone and everything. During the building of one of the new schools, they decided discovered over three and a half thousand graves. This was obviously a shocking discovery, and some clever people from the internet have tried to basically map out where these graves might have come from. So here are the sites of the two new schools in our modern Google Earth times, and here is the 1830s map of the area overlaid. And as you can see, or maybe can't see, it's a little hard to make out, but there are no graves or burial grounds. But 
when we take this map, which is technically undated, but is likely from between 1906 and 1956, we see the area clearly marked as burial ground. So it seems that sometime between when the map was made and when the school was set to be demolished, there was some lack of research done, some miscommunication, that ended up with this disused burial ground being uncovered. There are some conspiracy theories about this incident, saying that this was a mass grave that was related either to the Irish potato famine, as it was in Liverpool a common place of relocation for the Irish after the famine, or it was some kind of mass killing of people that took place in the 1800s. It was also thought that maybe these were plague pits, which were mass graves to put plague victims into, but that theory doesn't make tons of sense considering how close this is to the center of town, and it's not very smart to put loads of highly infectious plague victims in a high traffic area at the center of town. And people also thought that it was strange that large screens were put up as they were exhuming the graves to block any sight whatsoever of them. People suggested that maybe they were blocking off the bodies because maybe the people were killed in strange ways or because the bodies perhaps weren't even human. But from what I could find, these screens seem to be fairly standard protocol when dealing with bodies and graves out in the public like this. So this was a pretty shocking case, especially I'd say for the builders who dug up and uncovered this. And will we ever get a definitive answer on where the bodies and graves came from? Probably not, but it's definitely a case to think about. <laughs> The Great Sheep Panic was an event that happened on the 3rd of November in 1888. This was across southern England, where tens of thousands of sheep all fled their fields across a 200 mile area of Oxfordshire. This was around 8 o'clock in the evening, and all of these sheep, simultaneously apparently, broke out of their bonds and fled the fields and confinements that they were kept in, and most of them were found the next morning, scattered throughout fields, hedges, roads, it was sheep mayhem, and I don't use that term lightly. The papers reported that malicious mischief was out of the question, as a thousand men, they said, could not have frightened all of these sheep. So, I guess it was aliens? ghosts? Or perhaps it was, as noted in the Scientific Journal of Nature, that on that night it had been especially dark, and occasional flashes of lightning lit up the night sky. So perhaps it was lightning that scared these sheep silly. Maybe. I'm still gonna stick with aliens though. The Grinch of Gloucester, or Gloucester, or Gloucester? This was a kind of strange, kind of wholesome sighting of a man caught on CCTV dressed up as the Grinch, leaving presents for kids in various houses around Christmas time. He scared a few kids in the neighborhood and actually left gifts for one girl for her birthday outside of her house. He wrote in the letter, maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more, which is just a great line from a great story. He left her flowers and chocolates, and as this was in the years that we don't speak about, said that he ensured that everything was quarantined for three days. Now, I'm sure he communicated in some way to the parents beforehand, as they seemed to love it as well and weren't creeped out by a man leaving their teenage daughter presence. And after this, the whole neighborhood was left wondering if the kind Grinch would leave them presents this year. Hamster wheel broadcast interference. So this was a strange reported incident by a Redditor who said that in the early 2000s, he witnessed something very eerie and creepy on TV and years later couldn't find any evidence of it. He said he turned on the TV to Nickelodeon and saw a creepy black and white scene where hundreds of nude people were walking all around and in a line towards these hills in the background. And at these hills, there were these giant hamster wheels that were filled with a bunch of people walking inside of them, with a bunch more people either walking towards them or walking around them. He said he watched this scene in awe on loop for he doesn't know how long, and then eventually just changed the channel. Then he thought, what the fuck did I just watch? And why was it on 
on Nickelodeon. So he changed the channel back only to find it halfway through an episode of Spongebob. He flicked around channels for a while trying to find it, but never could. Nobody on the Reddit post was able to help him out or give him really any clues. So this is a strange case that has never been solved. Pretty odd. The Humpty Dumpty Circus is this strange stop motion short created in 1908 that sadly has been lost to the sands of time. This short film is widely believed to be the first ever example of a stop motion film and was made using a Humpty Dumpty Circus toy set that belonged to the producer's daughter. There's not much to go off on this case besides the fact that some people thought that it was made later than 1908, perhaps making it not the first ever stop motion film. And Smith, the producer, claimed that it was made years earlier than 1908, likely in an effort to make this even more ahead of its time than it actually was. But it was likely a cool little creative film nonetheless. The Jaguar F1 Diamond. So this story honestly sounds like more fiction than fact, but it is absolutely true. In 2004 at the Monaco F1 Grand Prix, Jaguar, one of the racing teams, had a sponsorship deal with an upcoming film, Ocean's 12, which if you haven't seen it, is a movie about a heist. Great film, honestly. But as part of this sponsorship deal, believe it or not, Jaguar had two massive $400,000 diamonds embedded into the front of their two race cars, which to me is such a strange, unusual, ballsy marketing decision. But hey, you do you, Jaguar. Weber, one of the drivers, made it through the entire race unscathed with the diamond intact. Good job, Weber. But the other driver, Klein, unfortunately crashed head-on right into one of the barriers. He was fine, thankfully, but the car was just obliterated. And the diamond was somewhere? The diamond was strangely not even insured and Jaguar team officials weren't even allowed onto the track until two hours after the race had finished due to safety regulations, by which point the diamond was nowhere to be seen. So it was either picked up by a lucky and somewhat dishonest, and I don't blame them honestly, racetrack worker, or it was embedded deep into a wall or barrier of some kind, and was claimed and pecked out by a lucky seagull at a landfill or something. Either way, Jaguar never recovered the second diamond, and I think Probably that serves them right for sticking a $400,000 diamond onto the front of a Formula One car. So grab a drink. My choice today is honey and lemon tea with ginger and cardamom. And join me as we explore the unsolved mystery iceberg. Jennifer Mary Beard was a 25-year-old school teacher who went missing in 1969. She was from New Zealand and Jennifer just loved to hike, like she couldn't get enough of it. So her and her fiancé had just recently arranged a hiking holiday where they would each travel separately around the South Island of New Zealand and then meet up together at the end just a few days later at a particular rendezvous point. But Jennifer never showed up. And when she wasn't there on the day that her fiancé had arranged with her, he immediately reported her missing. So the only real clues for this one, and there weren't too many of them, was that Jennifer was last seen around three or four days before this in a greenish, bluish car with an unidentified middle-aged man. And this was almost the extent of the clues that they had for her. There was no real other sightings after this, and there were no belongings found of Jennifer's, or obviously Jennifer herself. So there was a massive search on undertaken in the immediate area as well as surrounding areas, looking for Jennifer or some of her clothes or shoes or her backpack or anything they could find to give them more clues as to where Jennifer might be. And this was a really tough search as a lot of the area in that area was mountainous, hilly, swampy, not great terrain for a search, but obviously great terrain if you are into hiking. And the search went on and on and on. Eventually, Jennifer was found around a week later, dead underneath a bridge. The river that was flowing over her had severely decomposed her body, which meant that a bunch of the clues that you would normally get from a body weren't really there with Jennifer, which made the case all that much harder. But her trousers were around her knees, and the clothes on her upper body were wrapped around her neck. So that gave investigators some clue as to what likely happened. She was likely underneath the bridge 
relieving herself when someone came by, either the man from the bluish greenish vehicle or someone else entirely, and in the moment attacked and killed Jennifer. Her backpack and camera, which may have provided some evidence as to who she was actually with at the time, were never found. And sadly, both the man and the bluish greenish car have never been identified. And interestingly, disturbingly enough, Jennifer's body was actually found six days before or she was reported missing. She was reported missing on the 9th of January, but on the 3rd of January, there was a family actually driving down this very same road. The eight-year-old daughter of the family said she needed to go to toilets, so they stopped the car, the eight-year-old girl went underneath the bridge to relieve herself. And when she came up, she told the parents that there was a woman down there that didn't have any clothes on and the girl thought that she was sleeping. And the parents, I guess, didn't pay too much attention to this. I don't know if they thought she was lying or if it was just a homeless woman or drug addict that they didn't want to interact with, but they basically just ignored it and got back in the car and drove off. And I know Jennifer was already dead at the time and she was eventually found, but it must be a wild thought to be going over in your head if you are the parents or if you are especially the eight-year-old girl. Jennifer Odom was a 12-year-old girl who was found killed just 10 miles from her home. She got off of the bus on the way home from school one day and went missing and wasn't seen after this until her body was sadly found. The trail for this case ended fairly quickly as there really wasn't too much to go off and partly because of this dead end, the detectives resorted to using the services of a psychic, Nancy Myers, to try and give them some clues or direction as to the nature of the killing or the killer or killers themselves. There were a bunch of backs and forths and dead ends in this case, until finally a man named Jeffrey Crumb Sr., who was actually arrested and charged for many, many similar cases, and was actually already serving life in prison for these cases, was in 2023 charged with first degree murder, kidnapping, and assault in in Jennifer Odom's case. And if he is convicted of these charges, his sentence could be upgraded from life to death. So, fingers crossed. The Jersey Devil is fucking terrifying. I mean, just look at it. It is often described as a bipedal, kangaroo or wyvern-like creature with hooves, horns, small arms, a forked tail, and bat-like wings. It moves around very quickly and is often described as having a high-pitched, blood-curdling scream, which is just fucking perfect. As if it wasn't terrifying enough to begin with. It's called the Jersey Devil because it lives in New Jersey and it resembles the devil, I guess. So, scary stuff, lock your doors. Jerusalem Syndrome is the observed phenomenon where an otherwise perfectly healthy, mentally balanced person goes to Jerusalem and becomes delusional in some way. Whether it's thinking that the government or a secret group of people is lying to them and deluding them in some way, or stuff like them being God, or God speaking through them, or them being the Messiah, or Jesus, or some variation of that belief. And it's kind of an interesting thing to happen, as I guess the massive rush and influx of religious iconography, religious imagery, the religious environment of Jerusalem, and just even the historical significance of the area, for some people can bring rushing emotions that I guess completely flood their brain, and perhaps it's just so intense and euphoric that they can only conclude one thing from it, and that is since they've never felt this rush before, that either the feeling or they must be supernatural. And if they're going to Jerusalem and they believe in God and religion, Religion, that is likely what they will default to. It is an interesting but kind of sad phenomenon at the same time, as when anyone loses their mind, whether they just forget who they are, or they think they're Julius Caesar or Jesus Christ, it is always a sad thing to see, at least for me. And I guess when these feelings become so, so immense, that they can, in some cases, completely supersede logic. Joanna Lopez. So this missing persons case is very strange as we only seem to have parts of the missing case. So while watching these old television programs, this missing person image was shown at the end of one of these shows. And this was in 1989 and 1991 on WMAQ, which is a television channel in Chicago. The telephone number on the poster isn't connected anymore. And online searches for Joanna Lopez 
especially in Chicago, really don't turn up much evidence. She's not listed on any missing persons archive, or on any missing kids archive, and she's not listed on something as large as the Charlie Project. So she's like a missing, missing person. There have been efforts made by certain online communities, mostly Reddit, to try and identify, locate, find, and contact her. And although there were a few close calls with this contacting, they kind of fell through and still to this day, Joanna Lopez has never been identified or found. The John Lawson House. So this is a house in New York that's said to be haunted by spirits and possessed mannequins. The house itself is believed to be the oldest in the entire district and nobody really knows who exactly lives there, if anyone. But there are definitely three residents of the house and these are the three mannequins that sit out on the porch and simply watch the world go by. Now the strange and creepy thing about these mannequins is that they often change position, hairstyles, clothes, and nobody has ever been seen going onto the porch in order to move them around or change any of their looks. Clearly they are possessed. I mean clearly. There is absolutely zero doubt in my mind about that. If you are enjoying this video, be sure to tip the like button and the subscribe button and notification bell if you don't want to miss any future videos. There are some really cool ones coming out before the year ends, and you can always unsubscribe later if you really want. I mean, I will cry if you do, but you always have that choice. Let me know what you are drinking down in the comments below, and for now, Let's get back to the video. John Wade Wagner was this man or boy who went missing in 1968 at the age of 16. There isn't much to go off on this case. John was last seen dropping off his younger brother at a school dance and then was never seen again after this. His truck, his coat, his keys, his gloves were all found left in an alleyway in town and there were some rumors that John had actually gotten into a fight with one of the boys from school, had been hit, had fallen over, hit his head on something and died and then was subsequently disposed of in some way. But this has never been confirmed and still to this day, John Wagner remains a missing person. John Weeks was a man who went missing in 1997. And there's a lot of missing people's cases in this week's episode. Now, John worked for a man named Marvin Gabrion, who honestly looks like a serial killer, albeit from the 1950s, but still a serial killer. And I just noticed this, but doesn't he look a bit like an evil Walt Disney? Like Walt Disney's evil twin or something? Like, surely it can't just be me. Anyway, this Marvin man, Marvin Gabrion, was an absolute monster. He was convicted of kidnapping, assault, and multiple cases of battery and murder and one of them involved him duct taping this woman's eyes and mouth it was a woman named Rachel he duct taped her eyes and mouth chained her to a block of concrete and dumped her in a nearby lake she also had an infant daughter who was never found so John Weeks the guy who went missing actually had known the murdered woman Rachel and had also worked for Marvin John was also a little smitten on Rachel as he had actually asked her out on a date a few weeks prior prior to this. Now, it's not thought that John had anything to do with Rachel's murder, but it is thought that Marvin had something to do with John's disappearance and potentially likely murder. But since John's body was never found, we can't really know that for sure. But thankfully, Marvin is doing life in prison and they are pushing really, really hard for the death penalty. So again, with this one, Fingers crossed. The June 1962 Alcatraz escapees. And this case is absolutely awesome. So I'm sure everyone has heard of Alcatraz and even of the great escape from here thanks to the film Escape from Alcatraz. I've actually got a full feature length video covering this escape being released soon enough as when I did research into this escape it just absolutely blew me away and fascinated me to no end so I think you'll really like this one especially if you're into stuff like heists and prison breaks but as the name suggests this takes us back to June 1962 on the island of Alcatraz in San Francisco the three escapees John and Clarence Anglin and Frank Morris had been planning this escape for roughly six months and their preparation was to say 
say the least, elaborate and extensive. They had made these paper mache heads of their own likeness and painted them with paint found in one of the workshops in prison and actually used hair from the barbers to give it a very lifelike look. They got these fake heads, stuck them in their beds when they were escaping. And so because of this, the escape wasn't actually discovered until the following morning. The men used blades, spoons, and an improvised drill to widen the ventilation shaft in the back of their cells. And this led out into a disused and unmanned maintenance corridor that ran along the back of the cells. And when they weren't using the holes in the back of their cells that they had dug, they concealed them with cardboard, painted the same color as the walls of the cells. So already this is pretty complicated and pretty impressive. And if anyone out there has seen the TV show Prison Break, I can actually see a ton of inspiration for the plot actually coming from this Alcatraz escape. So they would occasionally go out these back holes in their cells into the corridor and then climb up to the top unused cell block. And all the way up there, they made like a makeshift workshop in which they built certain things that they needed for their escape. So some of the things that they built were life preservers, as Alcatraz is obviously an island, and so to escape from it, they needed to somehow float across the water, and so they built these life preservers so they wouldn't drown, and they built them using 50 raincoats that they had acquired over the six months, as well as a few other materials, and they found the design for these life preservers in an issue one of them read of Popular Mechanics. They also made a 6 by 14 foot rubber raft that was hand stitched all the way along and sealed with liquid plastic bought from the prison shop. The parts of the boat were then heated and sealed together using the heat from some of the steam pipes nearby. So that's basically all the prep done for the escape. So on the actual night of the escape, they propped up their paper mache heads, left the cell through the hole, carried all the stuff they needed, got up to the roof, and then scaled down a pipe on the outside of the prison. And they also picked the perfect area that was like this small blind spot where the searchlight and the guard towers weren't able able to see or didn't regularly check. So in the mask of darkness, after making it to the ground, they climbed up and over two 12 foot tall barbed wire fences, then continued out to the shore and then used a concertina, which is like this small air based musical instrument. And they used that sort of as a pair of bellows to inflate the raft. And then they set out on their destination, not to the mainland, but to Angel Island, which is two miles north. And it should be noted that by the time time the escapees made it to the shore, it was only around 10 p.m. that night. And partly because of the paper mache heads that they left, the escape wouldn't even be discovered until the following morning. So they had quite a few hours to make their crossing. And that was basically the end of it. The escapees were never found or seen from again, and the official official theory is that they likely drowned in the waters making the crossing, but that has never really been confirmed because, as I said, the prisoners were never found. And so because of this, the fate of the three prisoners is still a complete mystery. I will be covering this case in much more detail a little later on, as it is a very, very fascinating, complex, and at least to me, interesting case. And the these escapees were genuinely some clever clogs. The Klein brothers were three brothers, Danny, David, and Kenneth, who went missing in 1951 Minneapolis. They were only four, six, and eight years old, and they left their home to go spend some time in the nearby Farview Park. The boys were seen leaving their home, running down the road, and sadly were never seen again. There was a search done with police dogs, and the trail led them to the Mississippi River, and then just ended. So because of this, the police ended the case five days later, seemingly content with the theory that the boys had simply gone to the river and drowned, but their bodies were never found. And the family, especially at the time, strongly disagreed with the police's conclusion that the three boys had drowned. And they thought that they perhaps could have been kidnapped or even worse. The family never gave up in their search for the boys. And when the parents died, the four remaining brothers, 
picked up where they left off. Wait, they had seven sons? And so, the remaining brothers put up computer-aged photographs of the missing brothers, and acquired the help and services of the FBI, of private investigators, and even of psychics to try and help them find their brothers, or at least figure out what actually happened. But to no avail. Chris Kramers and Lisanne Froon. So this case as a whole is really wild and tragic and sad and puzzling. These were two Dutch students who went missing while hiking on the El Pianista Trail in Panama in 2014. As I said, the girls were from the Netherlands and they had planned this six-week vacation in Panama. They planned on traveling a bit, seeing the sights, helping the local people, and just getting a vibe and feel for another country and another culture. They were in Panama for two weeks out of the six before they arrived in Cherokee, Panama, where they were to live with a local family for one month while helping out local children. And on the morning of April 1st, they went out for a walk a hike around and near the forest that surrounded the Baru volcano. And after this, they were never seen alive again. There was a wide search of the entire forest and surrounding areas done by both Panamanian and Dutch officials and authorities, but the girls at the time were not found. The two girls had been keeping in contact with both of their families for the entire trip, text messaging them, calling them daily, but after they went missing, the calls and texts just completely stopped and the search slowly after a while started winding down as just nothing was found but 10 weeks later a local woman found one of the girls backpacks in the jungle and inside the backpack was cash two pairs of sunglasses, Froon's passport and camera, a water bottle, two bras, and the two girls' phones. But the bodies were nowhere to be seen. So naturally, the authorities took a look through the phones and through the camera, and what they found painted a dark picture. They were able to see that the two girls had tried dialing 112, which is the emergency number used in the European Union, and they had also tried dialing 911, which is the emergency number used in Panama. But none of these calls ever went through as they didn't have enough reception where they were calling from. These calls were at around 5 p.m. on the day of their disappearance, which is around six hours after they had left on their hike. And three days later, on April 4th, Froon's phone battery would die. And between April 5th and April 11th, Kramer's phone would be intermittently turned on, seemingly to check for signal, and then turned off. But in these six days, her PIN number was never entered correctly, meaning either the person turning on the phone didn't even enter the PIN number, or they did enter it, but they entered it in incorrectly. Maybe either because they forgot it, or the person using the phone never knew it to begin with. The camera contained photos from the 1st of April, showing some scenery, their initial hike route, just basic kind of holiday photos. And then there was nothing, until the 8th of April, when around 90 flash photographs were taken, deep in the jungle, in almost complete darkness. These photos showed a backpack strap, a mirror, some plastic bags on top of a rock, and the back of Kramer's head, as well as many other things. Months later, the remains of the girls were eventually found, just a few kilometers from where they found the backpack. They discovered a pelvis bone, a boot with a foot inside of it, as well as up to 30 three bones and bone fragments scattered around the area. A pretty tragic case, but it was initially not handled very well by the Panamanian authorities, which led to theories and suspicions of the two girls being victims of a local murderer, which I think is maybe unlikely, but it is still possible. It seems, at least to me, that the pair sadly either got injured and or lost in the jungle, couldn't make their way back to where they came from, couldn't make their way to safe or to help of any kind, and without any reception to actually call for help, they just never made it out. They honestly seemed like great, adventurous, kind people. And so, rest in peace, Chris and Lisan. Christine Smart was a 19-year-old college girl who went missing in 1996, California. She had been at a birthday party at around 2 a.m. at a frat house, and she was found passed out on a neighbor's lawn, which I guess is the natural state for college kids, apparently. And the two students who found her, Cheryl and Tim, helped Christine to her feet and went to walk her back to her dorm. When another student, Paul Flores, rushed out of the party and offered to help walk her back as well. 
So the group went back, Christine staggering the whole way, and one by one on this little journey, the students each went their separate ways, back off to their own dorms. Tim left first, then Paul convinced Cheryl that he would take Christine back to her dorm, as it was right next to his, so he could make the trip on his own. Cheryl apparently was happy with this, she went back to her dorm, and apparently, according to Paul, he took Christine as far back as his dorm. Then he let her walk the rest of the way back to hers, while he went inside and went to sleep. But after this, Christine was never seen again. She did not have any cards or cash on her at the time of her disappearance, and there has since been legislation actually brought into effect that says that all public colleges must immediately report any missing students to the local authorities, as this college at the time was completely slammed for not reporting Christine's disappearance, waiting an entire week before reporting it to the local authorities. They said that they thought Christine had taken a random unannounced holiday, apparently in the middle of the night with no cash and no card, like come on. And not much happened in this case for quite a few years, but the case continued and bit by bit it was built up, evidence was gathered, theories were crafted, an earring belonging to Christine here, some cadaver dog trails and potential grave sites there, and this was all focused around Paul Flores. They did ground penetrating radar on Paul Flores' father's home, and showed that he once had something or someone buried beneath his decking, and a search of Paul Flores' home in 2020 found, amongst other things, certain pills that some certain people put into other people's drinks at parties and at bars, if you know what I'm talking about, and homemade videos showing Paul aggressively fornicating, shall we say, with potentially unconscious women. And so, after all this, as well as the evidence gathered over the years, he was actually charged and convicted of Christine's murder. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison, and his father, who was originally charged of accessory after the fact, was eventually acquitted of this, which is a a great outcome to see Paul Flores actually convicted for this, but sadly still to this day, Christine's body has never been found. Leah Roberts was a troubled girl who went missing in 2000 Washington. Her parents had both died in recent years, which apparently left Leah feeling lost both spiritually and mentally, and so I guess she was just trying to find herself. She dropped out of uni only six months before graduating, and spent a lot of her time in a local coffee shop, right writing poetry in her journal. She would eventually go on this spiritual adventure of kinds, and one of the notes that she wrote for her roommate just before she left suggested that she had taken inspiration from Jack Kerouac, who was a writer who wrote books like On the Road and Dharma Bums, which are great books if you've never heard of them or read them, but they basically explore being an old school bum, living on the road, living from town to town, doing a lot of traveling, a lot of hitchhiking. It was seen as like the ultimate freedom back in the day, and it's it's kind of fallen off in popularity these days, but the books and writing emit this kind of sense of freedom and adventure and I guess lack of responsibilities in a way, and this is something that apparently appealed to Leah quite well. And the Dharma Bums, which is one of the books that she was reading, had actually scenes set in Desolation Peak, which is nearby where her car was eventually found. Her car was found crashed apparently, in a complete wreck, with a bunch of her belongings still in the car. But Leah was nowhere to be found. Before she left, along with the note, she actually left enough expenses for her housemates to cover her bills for around about a month which indicates potentially that she was only looking to be away for a month. Now, interestingly enough, the detectives eventually figured out that no one was in the car when it crashed, and that the car had actually been tampered with to allow it to accelerate without having to push down on the pedal, as well as a few other pieces of evidence. This meant that no one was in the car when it crashed, and that the crash was likely just staged. Now, whether this was staged by Leia, or whether it was something more sinister, someone had taken Leia and and then staged the crash, we don't exactly know. But in her final note, Leah said that she wasn't, you know, the S word, that she would never do anything to herself. But in fact, that it was quite the opposite. The reason for this trip was her immense thirst for adventure and her love of life, wanting to experience it in the most open, honest, and free way possible. And that was basically it. There were some potential sightings of Leah after the car crash, but they were never really confirmed. 
filmed. And so, where Leah is, nobody knows. But she seemed like a really groovy, cool creative, adventurous person who went through a hell of a lot in her life. And so, wherever she is, I genuinely hope she is happy. The Lost Mario Screamer. So this was this old internet video that was made in Windows Movie Maker 2, so that should give you some clue as to the age and quality of it. It featured a tutorial on how to unlock Luigi, and was named Super Mario 64 Big Star Secret. The video would take you through the steps that you needed to complete, kick a boo, run around the fountain x amount of times, tap A against this wall, etc. And the video ended as it was a screamer with a jump scare of the zombie from the k Fee Coffee commercial, which I think was a quite popular jump scare in those days. I won't scare you with it as it would ruin the ambiance of this video, but take my word for it, it was pretty scary. But this screamer, which was quite popular on YouTube, has since for some reason been taken down, and the video is seemingly, aside from these random screenshots, completely lost. So grab a drink, my choice today is honey and lemon tea, and join me as we explore the Unsolved Mysteries iceberg. The Managua event. So this was basically this hole in the ground in Managua, Nicaragua, which is said to be caused by a meteorite, but a lot of people actually have their doubts about this. Firstly, the hole looks kind of strange for an impact strike. It looks more like a sinkhole or excavation or something. And secondly, it's located quite nearby a Nicaraguan airbase. So there was this whole idea of it being kind of a strike test for a military sort of thing, either testing crashes or rockets or bombs. And then of course, there's the theory, some would say the best theory for anything, aliens. A crashed spaceship that was ransacked and looted by the government and then covered up. The actual event that caused this hole is kind of strange, and it's kind of what called it into question in the first place. There were no scientists who predicted or observed this crash, as they sometimes do with meteors or asteroids. There were no videos or photos taken of it whatsoever, whether that's like civilian photos or security footage or dashcam footage. So yeah, it's a rather strange one, and it does seem a little bit off for some reason, but nobody's quite sure exactly what happened for certain in Managua on that day. Markovian Parallax Denigrates. So these were a series of hundreds of messages, all posted in the early days of the internet to Usenet, which was like this early internet forum sort of thing. And I mean, just look at it. I love this early internet style. But these messages were all posted on Usenet with the subject line, Markovian Parallax Denigrates. They consisted of seemingly random words, gibberish really, with no punctuation or formatting whatsoever. So naturally, people were a bit confused. And over the years, the idea of it being a puzzle with like an encrypted code or something, similar to say the Cicada 3301 puzzle, started to surface. But no one could figure out, firstly, who created them, and secondly, what they even meant. If, in fact, as I said, they weren't just gibberish. It was also, of course, thought that maybe these messages could have just been pure, boring spam, or maybe some early attempt at a chatbot or text generator or something. There's really a bunch of possibilities for this, but nobody ever did figure out what it actually means. And so who posted them and what they meant is to this day still a mystery. Maura Murray was an American girl who disappeared in New Hampshire in 2004. Her car was found crashed into a snowbank along Route 112, but when police arrived, Maura was nowhere to be found. This is a bit of a strange case and things were off for Maura in the few days leading up to this disappearance. She emailed her boyfriend on the day of the disappearance, saying she didn't really feel like talking much, but that she would call him later that day. Then she made a call to a fellow nursing student for unknown reasons. Then she emailed her supervisor, saying that she would be out of town for a week due to a death in the family. But according to her own family, there was no such death. She packed her clothes, her toiletries, textbooks, and birth control to take with her, and she also packed most of her belongings in her room into these boxes and just left them in the room. Then she withdrew a bunch of cash, bought about $40 worth of liquor, and drove south along Interstate 91. Now, it should also be noted that she actually crashed her dad's car two weeks before this, but there was no sobriety test done for that crash, so we don't know whether she was sober or drunk at the time. She could have been drinking that night, but we just don't know. So around two hours after leaving onto the highway in Woodsville, New Hampshire, a woman heard a loud 
loud bang outside of her house. And when she went out there, she saw Maura's car crashed into a snowbank. Other witnesses around saw a young woman, apparently Maura, in the car and then walking around the car. And she pleaded with them not to call the police, saying that she had already called AAA, but AAA had no record of this call. So it's likely that she hadn't called AAA and she just didn't want the police involved. One of the main witnesses who saw her said she didn't really seem injured, but she just seemed very cold and shivery. But when the police eventually arrived, Maura was nowhere to be seen. On the inside of the car, they found these red stains, which were later determined to be just red wine. But Maura, along with her credit cards, her debit cards, her phone, and some bottles of liquor were all missing. There was no obvious evidence of foul play. And in my opinion, she either disappeared on purpose, like ran away essentially, or she just fled the scene of the crime hoping to come back later when she was maybe a little more sober. Or as she was in the middle of nowhere, she perhaps tried to get reception. And because she was likely drunk and freezing, maybe either passed out or collapsed or fell into a hole or pit or lake or something and just died of exposure. It's a very sad case. And while there is a bunch of circumstantial evidence surrounding it, there's honestly not really enough to go forward with any particular theory. And Maura Murray to this day has never been found. The Michigan Dogman was a creature spotted in Wexford County, Michigan in 1887. And just look at this thing. My god, that is terrifying. It was seven feet tall, blue or amber eyed, with the head and characteristics of a wolf, but it had a stride, a howl, a scream that was very human-like. It is said to only appear in years ending with the number seven, so 1887, 1937, etc. And reports of this creature go all the way back to when the native tribes used to live there. Truly a terrifying creature, but if you live in the area, at least you have a few more years until 2027 to prepare arm yourself and keep a lookout for the Michigan Dogman. Mickey and Minnie Mouse sex tape. So this is a kind of wild, kind of funny, kind of unconfirmed story. The story goes that on Walt Disney's 35th birthday, his brother arranged a surprise party for him with a bunch of the other Disney employees. And two of the animators thought it would be funny to animate a short sex tape of Mickey and Minnie Mouse, which they subsequently showed to everyone, including Walt. Walt apparently laughed with with everyone else and actually complimented the quality of the animation, asking who made it. And when the two animators came forward, he immediately fired them on the spot, ordered the destruction of all copies of this animation, and then left the building. The actual story for this has been debated over the years on whether or not it actually happened. And if it did happen, the existence of these tapes has also been debated. So whether or not they survived or not. So we'll likely never know for certain unless the tapes get discovered somehow. Or of course, if they get reproduced by AI, which might happen. It's probably already happened, but that is none of my business. Missing Thunderbird photos. The Thunderbird was this giant bird-like creature that had a wingspan of like 36 feet. And the story goes that it was shot and killed by two cowboys in 1890, Arizona. It was said to have smooth, scaly skin, featherless wings, and a face like an alligator. So a dragon, basically, or even like a pterodactyl maybe? A picture of the cowboys showcasing the dead bird was said to be published in a local newspaper at the time, but no copies of that newspaper exist today. Then in the 1960s, there was a story published that referenced the 1890s story while also referencing the photograph taken at the time. So there was a bunch of people that were connected to and were following this story that just went mad trying to find this original photo. People swore online that they had seen this photograph sometime in the past, but no one could actually find it. Only hoaxes and or unrelated photographs. This might be an example of the Mandela effect, and no one did ever find that photograph, if it or the bird ever actually existed, which to this day, we're not entirely sure they did. Mona Blades was an 18-year-old New Zealand woman who disappeared in 1975. She was hitchhiking on the North Island of New Zealand and was last seen getting into an orange station 
wagon, which was later seen turning off the highway and onto a small rural road, and then was just never seen again. There were a few interesting and strange leads in this case, one of which was an old man, Charlie Hughes, who was a person of interest for many years, but always denied having anything to do with Mona's death, or rather disappearance. Another was when some new homeowners found the name of Mona Blades etched into the concrete floor of a garage in a home that they had just bought in New Zealand, and this was 30 years after her disappearance. So they called the police suspecting it might be a hidden grave of sorts, but it was discovered that the concrete had actually been etched like six years before this by the previous homeowners as a joke. I mean, Haha, ha, I guess. And then there was also a man named John Freeman, who had rented an orange station wagon the weekend that Mona disappeared, and two weeks after the disappearance, when police announced that they were looking for someone with this type of vehicle, John proceeded to shoot and wound a student at a local school before taking care of himself. So that's not suspicious or anything, but that's really as far as the investigation got. And sadly, Mona Blades, dead or alive, was never found. Mount Yamantu Bunker Complex. Ah, the Russian Urals. Nothing bad ever happens here. Like, nothing. The name itself, Yamantu, is derived from the local language, literally translating to bad or evil mountain, which, I mean, should be some sort of omen, but it is just a really hellish place and area to deal with. There are huge bear populations, there are swamps, there are rocky slopes. It's just all round not a great place to be. But the area was thought to house a secret, or not so secret, military bunker by the Russians. And when questioned about it, the Russians have given multiple different answers, which is probably understandable. They're not just going to give away military secrets. But they have said it is a mining area and town, that it is a high security bunker for Russian treasures, a food storage area, or a secret bunker for Russian leaders in case of a nuclear war. So many, many different answers. It was first spotted by US satellites after the fall of the Soviet Union, and the US claim that it's either a secret military bunker or a nuclear testing site. But nobody really knows for sure. Well, I guess the Russians know for sure, but they're not speaking. Not even in Russian. It is featured in a few video games, like Black Ops, for example, where it's a secret military base that houses a powerful chemical weapon, the Nova 6. But as I said, as for what's actually down there, we will likely never find out. The murder of Dana Bradley. So Dana Bradley was a 14-year-old girl who went missing in New Newfoundland, Canada in 1981. She was hitchhiking nearby, then went missing, then was found dead four days later in a nearby wooded area. On the day she went missing, she left school, went to a friend's house, and then made her way home to attend a birthday party, but she hitchhiked home apparently, and was seen by a witness getting into a car, and then yeah, she was found with her skull fractured, having been assaulted, and with her school books still on her, which is just absolutely heartbreaking. There were a few leads and suspects for this case, but a man named David Grant Summerton in 1986 confessed to the murder. But after confessing, he later recanted his confession, saying that the police had basically forced him into saying it. And so, with the lack of any other major evidence, the charges on David were dropped, and he was instead instead convicted of public mischief for the fake confession and was sentenced to two years in prison. Police say they receive an average of like 50 tips per year regarding Dana's murder, but as of today, her case is still open and still unsolved. The Oak Grove Jane Doe was an unidentified woman found dead and dismembered in the Willamette River in 1946, Oregon. This one is kind of messed up, but they basically found her body in parts. First they found her torso, and then her arms and thigh, and then her hands and feet, and then a few months later they found her head. They also discovered a bunch of her clothing and belongings, an overcoat, a sweater, some underwear, all stuffed in a bag wrapped in rope and weighted down with these sash weights, so someone obviously really didn't want these to be found and hoped they would never resurface. She is thought to have been a woman between 40 and 50 years old, between 5'2 and 5'4, but sadly, in all these years, 
she has never been identified. Oklahoma City Jane Doe. So this wasn't a entire body found, but it was just a leg. It's very strange, but this was in the aftermath of the Oklahoma City bombings. And after going through all of the body parts, all of the victims, assigning each body part to a victim, and assigning each victim to an identity, there's this woman's leg that doesn't belong to any victim, or apparently to any co-conspirator. Or like all the body parts and people are accounted for, except this woman woman's leg. So very strange and very creepy, but still to this day police don't know who this leg belonged to, whether this woman is still alive or not, or even who this woman was. Opelika Jane Doe. So the Opelika Jane Doe is now a solved case, but it's also really messed up at the same time, so I thought I'd cover it anyway. In 2012 Alabama, police were called to a trailer park because skeletal remains were found there. They determined the remains to belong to a child between the age of four and seven, which is just horrific. The skeleton had fractured and healed bones all over it, from her skull to her arms, her legs, her ribs, suggesting that these didn't necessarily kill her, but rather were just evidence of ongoing abuse. She was also likely malnourished and at least partially blind in her left eye due to a broken eye socket. So yeah, some really fucked up and twisted parents, or whoever was responsible for her at the time. So who were the parents. Well, at this, police were kind of stumped. They weren't able to get a DNA sample of the remains, so they started looking around for photos of kids, maybe missing kids, in local schools, churches, that sort of thing, to try and identify her, but that didn't really get them any closer to solving it. However, in 2022, a DNA sample was successfully acquired from the skeletal remains and was linked to a man named Lamar Vickerstaff, who was the child's father. He was was a navy man and he said that this was his biological daughter but that he had never seen her before and he didn't even know she existed so he gave the police a potential list of names for who the mother might be you know maybe he knocked someone up years ago and unknowingly they never contacted him they had the kid without him and perhaps the mother raised the little girl all alone so police then took this list of women went through them all narrowed them down and determined the only reasonable identity of of the mother. They went to her, confirmed a DNA match, and she said that she had given birth to this child, obviously many years ago, but then Lamar Vickerstaff and his wife had taken legal and physical custody of this child, and this was proven by court records, by documentation, and by witness testimony. They reached out to school boards, to local police, to hospitals, etc., and found that the girl was never registered or enrolled in any school, and was never reported missing, as as Lamar and his wife then said happened. So the two were obviously arrested, Lamar was charged for felony murder, and his wife was charged for failing to report a missing child. So as I said, it's a pretty messed up case, but it's a relief that the police were actually able to get to the bottom of it, and at least bring some sort of semblance of justice for this little girl. The P versus NP problem. So this is a mathematical or logical puzzle or problem that actually has a one million dollar reward reward for anyone who solves it. It is quite complex, but the simplified version of this is that imagine P and NP being labels for different types or difficulties of problems. P problems are very easy to solve, and NP problems are very easy to verify, but difficult to solve. So say if I give you this very simple puzzle, which is just to arrange these pen amounts from lowest to highest. So we have one over here and three over here. You can solve this puzzle almost instantly, as there's only two pieces of very simple data. You know, if this one is higher than this one, just swap them and that's puzzle solved. And if this one is lower than this one, just don't do anything. And then you've arranged them from lowest to highest, so puzzle solved. So because it's very easy and quick to solve, and very easy to verify, you can just take a quick glance and see that this is the right order, then it is a P-class problem. But take for example a very complex Sudoku puzzle, and once it's solved, it's fairly quick to verify verify. You can just look at the board and check whether it's correct or not, and it'll probably take you like 30 seconds or even less. But this same complex Sudoku puzzle would take a lot longer
longer to actually solve. It'd probably take you 10 minutes, if not longer. And then when you show it to someone, they can verify it within a few seconds. So that would be a NP problem. Easy to verify, difficult to solve. And I hope I haven't lost anyone with this explanation. And so the whole idea of P versus NP is that if we could solve or write some algorithm that proved or made P equal to NP, then that would mean that any puzzle or problem that was easy to verify would also be easy to solve, meaning it would completely change how logic worked, it would give us massive advancements in computer technology, in mathematics, in science, and it would mean immense advancements for the whole of mankind. But that is a big if, and there are a lot of people that question whether this is even possible or not, but until someone does prove it, we are stuck with just easy problems and difficult problems. And I did simplify this down quite a bit, as I don't want to cause anyone too great of a headache, but do some research into it on your own if you are interested in it. The Palm Springs Friendly Murders. So the Friendlies were a family living in Palm Springs in the 1990s. They were fairly wealthy, lived in a good neighborhood, and so, like any self-respecting wealthy couple, they owned a pool. And when making his rounds one day, the pool boy came into the house and saw the maid lying dead in a pool of her blood, having been shot once in the head. Sophia Friendly, the wife, also lay dead in the hallway having been shot from behind, and Edward Friendly, her husband, was sat in his study, TV still on full blast, and he had been shot once in the chest and once in the head. There were no witnesses, no one heard any gunshots, and there was no evidence of forced entry of any kind into the home, with police saying that it looked like the work of a professional assassin. So who were the suspects for these horrific killings? Well, Sophia's first husband at the time was sick, and he in fact died just two weeks after these murders. So quite a coincidence. And with Sophia and her old husband dead, the trust fund that they had went to their children, Edward and Sophia Hutton, as opposed to going to their mum, Sophia Friendly. So we've got a motive perhaps. Money makes a fair bit of sense, but who actually did the killings? Well, when Edward Hutton was being interviewed, they found out that he had a friend, a Scandinavian criminal named Andreas Christensen, who then and since then has become the prime suspect in this case. He had actually met the friendlies a short while before the murders, in quite a casual, amicable context, so it's reasonable to think that they might have opened the door for him and let him into the house, if maybe he had a good enough reason. But the police had no real evidence linking him to the actual murders, so they went to gather some by interviewing him, but he had already fled to Zimbabwe. So that was basically the end of it, until Denmark signed a treaty, allowing citizens of Denmark to be tried for crimes committed in America, and Andreas was actually picked up by police in Copenhagen after he had actually committed a bank robbery, and he was only back in Denmark because he was escaping Zimbabwean charges of embezzlement. So he's just like the perfect international criminal, I guess. As I said, Christensen was is still their main suspect, but after numerous evidence and some almost damning evidence, police in the end decided not to try and convict Christensen, as they thought the evidence just wasn't quite there, and that's where this case remains today. The children of the friendlies, now in their 70s, refused to answer any more calls or questions, and this case was never solved. Panic in the Woods is the name given to the strange, unexplainable panic that seems to take people over when they they're far from civilization, whether that's out hunting, out camping, or even, if you will, in the woods. There are loads of accounts of people getting disoriented, scared, panicked, and running off into the woods, becoming lost, running or falling off cliffs, etc. So it's kind of weird. But the term panic in the woods is often written to emphasize the pan in panic, as the word panic actually comes from the Greek god Pan, being the god of the wilderness, of nature, of mischief almost. And originally panic actually used to refer to precisely this. The fear and worry and madness someone gets when going out into nature. So, of course, Pan himself is seen as a cause for the panic in the woods, but so are ghosts, magnetic fields, low oxygen levels, extraterrestrial beings, spirits, and just a whole range of other things. But obviously there has been no definitive answer for this, and why people tend to go a bit mad and get filled with terror when they're out in the woods like this is maybe unlikely to be solved anytime soon. Pan 
panspermia. Panspermia is the idea that life exists everywhere in the universe and didn't originate on Earth. And the idea is that life is spread here and there through stuff like space dust, comets, asteroids. Maybe it formed on another planet somewhere and that planet just fucking blew up or something and sent these tiny microscopic organisms all out into the universe. One happened to land on planet Earth via something like a comet or asteroid. And then because Earth was quite suitable, it flourished and grew and evolved and then eventually started to produce YouTube videos. Now there's not a huge amount of evidence for this theory other than it just being kind of a neat idea and critics say that it doesn't really answer the question of where life came from it simply just pushes it back to another planet and obviously the next question would be well how did life on that planet start and you never really get down to a proper solution but that is the theory of panspermia the paris catacombs mystery man this is a reference to this creepy camcorder footage found of a man exploring these underground catacombs in paris Paris. He's kind of filming as he's exploring them, then he gets panicked, starts running, and eventually drops the camera and is never seen or heard from again. These catacombs are huge, and during the 1700s the city buried up to 6 million people in them, as a lot of these cemeteries at that time were becoming overcrowded. Some say he made it out and just never spoke about it again, others think he got lost and panicked, which is honestly not a hard thing to do down there, and then he obviously just collapsed and died, with his remains blending into the millions of other bodies down there. And some say it was simply a hoax. The camcorder footage was found by a group that went down there exploring the catacombs, and I really, really hope this was a hoax, as dying down there in the cold and dark, along with millions of skeletons, is fucking terrifying and probably one of the worst ways to go. Peaches was an unidentified woman, a Jane Doe if you will, whose torso was found in New York in 1997, and whose body had a tattoo of a peach, hence the name Peaches. When they found the body, her head was actually missing, so police weren't actually able to make any kind of physical ID on her, and so to this day she still remains unidentified. But there were recently some additional remains found, including those of her biological child, which is incredibly messed up, but these have led police to suspect she might have something to do with the Long Island serial killings, and hopefully they'll find out more information about her and the case, but at this point in time, nobody knows who Peaches actually is. Phantom Social Worker Origins. So this one is like super creepy. Basically, mostly in the 1990s, there were a bunch of reports filed to the police of people showing up at parents' houses, pretending to be social workers, and then trying to kidnap essentially the kids. There were apparently hundreds of these reports over the years, and although police actually investigated them and even set up special task forces, they were never able to gather sufficient evidence or find any suspects for these occurrences. Some say that it was just annoyed or shitty parents reporting actual social workers. Some say that these social workers were just concerned neighbors who lied in order to get themselves into the home to inspect the children, just to check if their parents were like hitting them or not. Some say this was an evil cult of sorts, going door to door trying to abduct these children, and some say this was all just a case of scare stories, urban myths or legends, and that none of these actually occurred. Still a pretty wild and creepy idea though, and I hope none of these parents actually let their kids go without like proper confirmation or a police escort or something. The Piri Reis map is a super fascinating world map created by the Ottoman Admiral Piri Reis. There is only roughly one third of this map remaining, as the rest has been lost, and and it's currently housed in a palace in Istanbul. And as for the map itself, it is enchanting. It's an Islamic world map with some Islamic miniatures or drawings appearing all over it. There are some areas on the map which are accurately depicted, but that weren't thought to be discovered until much later. There are also some areas on the map like lands and islands that don't even exist, at least not anymore. There was also apparently a lot of inspiration taken from Europeans like Christopher Columbus and Marco Polo, which again is quite unusual as it was kind of frowned upon in the Islamic 
Islamic medieval world to draw on and get inspiration from so many non-Islamic sources and explorers. And the world map also didn't apparently go along with the very popular at the time idea, which is showcased in pretty much all other Islamic world maps, of the inhabited quarter. That is, the entire world being surrounded by this giant impassable ocean. So there are many, many ways that this map was strange and unique, both to the times and to the cultures and ideas of that time. But this is a super interesting one to read about and look into in detail if you are into that sort of thing. The Publius Enigma is a very odd one. If you haven't heard of the band Pink Floyd, go and check them out. I don't know why I have to say that, surely everyone has heard of Pink Floyd. They are, in my opinion, probably the best band ever, and I think that they just make masterpieces, not just songs. But that's a discussion for another day. Anyway, they have an album called Division Bell, which they released in 1994. And to go along with this album and seemingly to promote it, it is thought that they put out this enigma or puzzle that could be followed along with the album and worked out online. You know, pretty cool idea. This would get people buying the album, listening to the album, and discussing it on various different forums. So they posted on the early internet forums of Usenet, and the post went like this. The message. My friends, you have heard the message Pink Floyd has delivered, but have you listened? Perhaps I can be your guide, but I will not solve the enigma for you. All of you must open your minds and communicate with each other, as this is the only way the answers can be revealed. I may help you, but only if obstacles arise. Listen, read, think, communicate. If I don't promise you the answers, would you go? Publius. They then followed up with a clarification of the challenge, with, as some of you have suspected, the Division Bell is not like its predecessors. Although all great music is subject to multiple interpretations, in this case, there is a central purpose and a designed solution. For the ingenious person or group of persons who recognizes this, and where this information points to, a unique prize has been secreted. How and where? The Division Bell. Listen again, look again, as your thoughts will steer you. Leading the blind while I stared at the steel in your eyes. Lyrics, artwork, and music will take you there. They then also followed up with another message. To validate the trust of those who believe, as well as to reconcile the doubt of others. I have gone to great lengths to plan the following display of communication. Monday, July 18th, East Rutherford, New Jersey, approximately 10.30pm. Flashing white lights, there is an enigma. And on the night of the 18th of July 1994, patterns in the lights at the front of the stage at the Pink Floyd concert in East Rutherford momentarily spelled out the words Enigma Publius. Now, it should be noted that all of this was posted anonymously through something called the Pennet Remailer Service, which was honestly really cool for the time. Basically, if you wanted to remain anonymous while sending an email or posting on a forum or something, you would email this service, which was run by a guy in Finland, Johan Jolf Helsingius, and the service would receive your email, strip it of all the metadata, where it came from, who it came from, when it was sent, any digital signatures, etc., and then re send or remail the contents of that email out to whatever destination you wanted. So a super cool idea for the early days of the internet, allowing people to basically remain anonymous before something like VPNs. But when the remailer service was shut down, communications with this poster basically stopped. And so that just kind of further added to the mystery of these posts. There have been quite a few ideas and theories and even conspiracies surrounding this, but none have been officially confirmed as the solution to this puzzle. The drummer of Pink Floyd, Nick Mason, confirmed that the Publius Enigma did actually exist and was genuine, but said that it was made up and posted by the record company and not by Pink Floyd themselves. He said the prize was to be a crop of trees in a field or something like that. Like what? How about cash? gems, signed merch. Like, what am I gonna do with a bunch of trees on probably the other side of the world? But he said the puzzle was never solved, the prize was never given out, and so to this day, Publius Enigma still 
remains a mystery. Redhead Murders was the name given to a string of murders of redheaded women between 1978 and 1992. This was in America and most of the murders were committed in various different states, such as Tennessee, Kentucky, Arkansas, and the list just goes on and on. Most of the women killed had red or reddish hair. Most were either involved with sex work or were hitchhiking, and all were dumped and found along major highways. Now, everything about this string of murders seems to be a little unsure and kind of blurry. The amount of women killed range from 5 to 14 or more, they're not really sure. And police think all of the murders were committed by a single guy, but they say it could be two, three, or even more different murderers. One suspect was a trucker named Jerry Leon Johns, who attacked and strangled a red-headed woman and left her on the side of the road for dead. And this was in 1985, but she ended up surviving pulling through and later testifying against Jerry, who went to prison for this kidnapping and attack and ended up actually dying in prison 30 years later when he was 67. So definitely a terrible guy, but there was nothing really linking him to any of the other murders. Until about a year after he died, there was actually DNA evidence of Jerry's found on one of the redheaded victims, Tina Farmer. But since he was already dead, there was no one left to charge. So did he commit Tina Farmer and the rest of the girls' murders. It's possible, maybe even likely at this point, but we'll never know definitively for sure. And it's honestly just kind of really heartbreaking reading through all of these women and their circumstances and their backgrounds. And it's the same for most of the Jane Doe's on this list. Most, if not all of these women were just desperate in some way. They were either lonely or addicted to drugs or into sex work or all of the above. So obviously in a super vulnerable place, Place, or as was the case with 15 year old Tracy Walker, was just a confused kid who ran away from home and apparently took to hitchhiking to get from place to place. I kind of hope Jerry Johns committed these murders as that would mean that whoever did do them is no longer walking around. And with the DNA evidence they found, I think it's likely he did at least commit a few of these. But either way, Rest in peace to all of these found women. Richard Byers was a four-year-old boy who went missing all the way back in 1904, Indiana. He was outside in his family's front yard when he kept asking his mum if he could go down the street to see a baseball game that was being played. She repeatedly said no, stay in the yard, but that is when he vanished. A neighbor said that they saw a gypsy type character walk up to the kid and then they both went out and over the railroad tracks and that was the last that he was ever seen. But in 1908, four years after this, someone found a letter dropped apparently in the middle of the street that read, I don't know my name, but I think my papa is a doctor and lives in Sealyville. We are going to Terre Haute. The people I am with watch me very closely. Whoever finds me, please hunt for me. But by this point, four years later, there had already been massive searches done, there had been funding provided by locals and police forces, there were multiple investigations, interviews, but they'd never really had any major breakthroughs. So this was seen as a major thing. Over the years and from this letter, there were multiple tips sent in about all these boys that people suspected of being Richmond, and each time they were brought to the father's attention, and each time he confirmed that none of these were his boy. So he thought at the time, what would make this one any different? Then, just a few miles from Terre Haute, where the boy said that he would be, there was a young boy who had just recently been adopted by a man and his wife, and he was the spitting image of Richmond Byers. So after some investigation, some talks, the boy, the local police chief, and a bunch of people from the town all went down to the father's home. They brought the boy inside, the father looked over him, and then carried the boy out of the house, saying to the now formed crowd outside that he is not my boy. Take him away and do not bring him back again. And that was the end of it. Richmond Byers was never found, and sadly, to this day, this case still remains a mystery. Ronaldo at the 1998 World Cup final. So, a bit of a strange one, this. Ronaldo. Not this guy, but 
this guy, arguably one of the best players of all time, was a striker for Brazil. And with the team at the time performing so well, it was thought that Ronaldo would step up in the finals and bring the 1998 World Cup back to Brazil. But before the match started, the lineup surprisingly showed that Ronaldo wasn't even playing in the match. This was incredibly surprising to the fans and commentators, as there was no announced removal or ban from the team, and no announced injuries that he had sustained or any reason whatever for not including him in the game like he was their star player well the truth finally did come out years later when Ronaldo admitted that hours before the game he had suffered some convulsions and had blacked out for several minutes which is some scary stuff so obviously at the time they quickly took him to a hospital had him looked over did blood tests physical tests all sorts but in his own words it was like the convulsions never even happened the doctors could couldn't find any evidence for them or for what caused them. So that's why he was initially not on the roster, but he and the team then went back to the stadium after all the tests were done and Ronaldo was just very eager to play. And I mean, how could he not be? So just before the game, they put him back on the roster and fans noticed that he was playing nowhere near his usual skill level. He just seemed like an average run of the mill football player. And of course, France then went on to win the cup at a score of 3-2-0. There are, as always, a few theories surrounding this one. Did Ronaldo just get nerves before the match and so made up the whole convulsions thing? Was he bought off or threatened to throw the game and so he made up the convulsions as an excuse for his poor play? Was the manager bought off in some way or did he just genuinely have these terrifying convulsions that thankfully weren't anything more dangerous? But in that case, why not just substitute him out for another player? People are kind of undecided on this whole thing, but I guess nevertheless, it still cost Brazil the cup and we may just never know the real real truth of what happened on that day. Satoshi Nakamoto is the developer and original creator of Bitcoin but this name is actually a pseudonym meant to disguise and hide the actual creator's identity which I honestly didn't know until I researched this. Bitcoin was created in 2007 and 8 and the person or people who created it went by the name Satoshi Nakamoto and they were at the time in contact contact with other developers and users of various different forums. He was the sole editor of the source code at the time, up until 2010, when he transferred a bunch of the source code to various users in the community. And then he went radio silent. He owned, or rather likely still owns, around a million Bitcoin, meaning that when Bitcoin was at its highest worth, roughly two years ago, he would have had a net worth of over 73 billion dollars, making him the 15th richest person in the world at the time. Now, who Satoshi really was has been debated a bit over the years. He claimed to be Satoshi Nakamoto, a 37-year-old, obviously Japanese man living in Japan, but his English was seemingly impeccable. It could not be pecked. He occasionally made some references to various British newspaper articles. He used various British spellings like color and gray, and he used British terms and slang like like bloody hard, which is a bloody good term. And someone tracked all of his forum posts over the years and found that Satoshi generally wasn't posting between the hours of 5 and 11 a.m. on British time, which would make sense if that's the time roughly that he's sleeping. These same hours translate over in Japan to between 2 and 8 p.m., which doesn't make quite as much sense to be sleeping at this time over this many years, but it is obviously still possible. So all of this has led to to people thinking that Satoshi Nakamoto is actually a British man, or at least European, and maybe isn't even a single person, but a group of people. And this research was absolutely wild to me, as I genuinely thought over the years that the creator was just a Japanese guy, but apparently not. And now I really want to get into a weekend long conspiracy deep dive onto this, but I'll save my sanity and move on to the next entry. SDSS J124043.01 plus 67103.68. All right, never mind. My sanity is not making it through this one. So this long, confusing string of letters and numbers is nicknamed 
docs. Like, why couldn't you have just called it that in the first place? It goes from the most complex name in existence to this three-letter word. So Dox is this white dwarf found in the Draco constellation. And white dwarfs are basically dead stars that are still immensely hot. And Dox is just an unusual white dwarf. Its atmosphere is made up almost entirely of oxygen, with little dashes of magnesium, neon, silicon, a lot of the heavier elements. But no hydrogen or helium, the lighter elements. Basically, in giant stars, these lighter elements, which were everywhere when the universe began, all get converted into heavier elements, like a lot of the ones we have down here on Earth. But this particular white dwarf is a lot smaller than it should be for converting these sorts of elements. And even if it were previously a lot bigger than that, stars that are big enough to convert these elements tend to collapse down into at least neutron stars, if not black holes, and don't typically just collapse into a white dwarf. So it's kind of like a small star that has the properties of a large star, which is what's so puzzling about it. And sorry if I'm confusing everyone with all of these space terms, but if you want a comprehensive iceberg of all of the most interesting space things, at least to me, I made an iceberg and a video on the iceberg just a short while ago, which you can check out just by going to my channel, typing in space iceberg or something. But be warned, it may hurt your head a little bit. It's cool to be a nerd. The Shugborough inscription is this. A monument built in Shugborough, Staffordshire, and on the monument is a carving, which is a rough depiction of the painting Et in Arcadia Ego by Poussin. And below the carving is a stone plaque with the letters Usvav, or rather O-U-O-S-V-A-V-V, -V, which is inscribed between the letters D and M. So what exactly does this inscription mean? Well, let's break it down. The D and M likely stand for Dismanabe, which is often used on Roman tombs, meaning basically dedicated to the shades, which is metal as hell, and the rest of the letters, well, that's kind of the mystery. Nobody really knows what they even stand for. One idea say the letters stand for the Latin phrase, Optimae Oxyris, Optimae Sorosis, Widius Amantissimus, Woit Virtutibus, which in English is best of wives, best of sisters, a most devoted widower, dedicates this to your virtues. Sounds nice, but it was pointed out that the Latin grammar is a bit off in this translation, so perhaps it's not that. It was also suggested to stand for Orator Ut Omnia, Sunt Vanitas, I Vanatus vanitatum, meaning vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity, which is a line from the Bible. Or oro ut omnes, sequanta viam, ad virum vitam, which is kind of an alternate version of a line from John 14, 6. Or some people say that it is perhaps a cipher or an encrypted code of sorts, perhaps equating to maybe someone's name. But there are a lot of different theories and not really much solid evidence for any one or the other, just kind of ideas and and theories. And even with all of the detective and encryption work we've done over the years for this, we still don't have a proper definitive answer. So grab a drink, my choice today is turmeric tea, and join me as we explore the unsolved mystery iceberg. The Sphinx's nose. So the Sphinx, as we all probably know, is this ancient, amazing structure. And this was built around four to five thousand years ago in ancient Egypt. But there have been a few strange changes to the statue over over the years, a bunch of which are just unexplained. There are theories that say the Sphinx's human pharaoh head was originally a cat head, so it was, you know, more consistent with the body of the Sphinx. Cat body, cat head, just one big stone cat. But this theory says that the original cat head was actually carved down to make the pharaoh head by, obviously, a pharaoh for whatever reason. Probably vanity, as with all good depictions. So perhaps the entire statue is way, way older than we actually think. Perhaps seven to 10,000 years, as opposed to like four to 5,000. And when the pharaoh who built the Sphinx, Pharaoh Khafre, when he built it, he didn't actually build it. He just discovered it, a super old Sphinx already there from thousands of years ago, and he maybe touched it up a little bit, and then, as we said, chipped away at the cat head to depict his own pharaoh head on the Sphinx. And this means that there would be an even more ancient Egyptian civilization a few thousand
thousand years before what we actually think of as ancient Egypt. And I think it's a perfectly reasonable theory. But another change that's quite commonly known about with the Sphinx is the breaking off or falling off of its nose. And there are a ton of theories about when it broke off, who might have broken it off, and for what reason. One theory is that Napoleon Bonaparte knocked it off, either accidentally or on purpose, during his invasion of Egypt. There's also another theory that says a Sufi from the 9th century saw that people were worshipping the Sphinx like a god, and so he took some weapons and tools to the Sphinx, knocked off its nose to show that it was flawed and just a statue. But again, nobody really knows for sure, and it does really always fascinate me, going through these ancient structures and civilizations to try and figure out what they were thinking, what they were up to, but hopefully we find some more evidence soon. Spontaneous human combustion. So this is a wild, kind of scientific, kind of pseudo-scientific theory, or idea, or phenomenon, that describes people randomly bursting into flames. And in this theory, there is no ignition, no source, no spark, as obviously if there was an explanation for any of these fires, they would not be classed under spontaneous combustion. So it's just people randomly going up in flames for absolutely no reason, which is pretty terrifying when you think about it, but it is considered widely as kind of pseudo-scientific because firstly, there isn't actually much evidence or data for these cases. And secondly, the data and instances when we find them typically tend to be the same sort of case. They're normally always elderly victims who have either been drinking recently or have a history of drinking. And so it is kind of widely accepted that these are old, frail, disoriented folk who perhaps have a few drinks and then stumble into a fireplace or a candle or trigger some sort of spark or flame and then sadly they fall over catch themselves alight and yeah but occasionally in these instances these people are either far enough away from the flames or the source so that the two aren't really linked or the source just isn't found for whatever reason and so these are attributed to the spontaneous human combustion theory so it's definitely a fun one seems kind of sci-fi-ish maybe in a story or a novel but as far as I can tell, you don't really need to be worried about spontaneously combusting into flames. Unless you're a drunk 90 year old near a uh, near an open fire or something. The squonk. So the squonk is this really strange creature found in the hemlock forests in northern Pennsylvania. It was first mentioned or noted in a book from 1910, Fearsome Creatures of the Lumberwoods. And this creature is said to travel mostly in twilight and dusk, so in low light because it is extremely ugly. And it typically travels quite slowly and carefully as it's always trying to make sure it doesn't accidentally look at any puddles of water in case it sees its ugly reflection in them. Its skin doesn't fit too well on its body, if you can imagine that. It's covered in warts and moles and is just constantly unhappy. And hunters who wish to track the squonk do so by following its tear-stained trail as the creature is just constantly crying, I guess, because of how ugly it is. And man, this is a really sad creature. If one is able to track the squonk and corner it or scare it or surprise it, the squonk may even just dissolve itself into a puddle of tears. Poor squonk. Starlight is this mysterious material that was invented in the 1970s in the UK, but the rights to it were later bought by Thermashield, an American chemical company. This material, Starlight, is honestly fascinating. It is essentially painted onto whatever you want to protect, and when heat is applied, either through fire or through lasers or through an oven, the material itself begins to char and expand, creating this foam around the object that is super fire resistant and basically completely protects the item. It was demonstrated on an egg at one point, and after blowtorching it for like five minutes straight, the egg was still raw and cold to the touch. And when using a plasma torch, it took them around nine seconds to heat a piece of candy up to 900 degrees Celsius. But when they coated another piece of candy in just a small layer of starlight, the plasma torch wasn't able to raise the temperature of the candy to any higher than four 40 degrees Celsius, which is just mildly warm, I guess, like sitting on the piece of candy in your back pocket. Now, the components and ingredients to make up Starlight are 
completely unknown and are a closely guarded company secret. But the original creator's daughter, who bear in mind doesn't own Starlight anymore, said that all the ingredients for at least the original Starlight recipe were edible. Like you could technically consume Starlight without suffering any ill effects. But legal disclaimer, don't go out and eat Starlight. That would be a terrible idea and I bear no responsibility for anyone who does. And I don't know why you would want to. Maybe if you had heartburn or something, just coat your heart with a little bit of Starlight. Just create a foam shield around your heart. Supple that heartburn coming up from your stomach. I don't really know how heartburn works. But with this clue that the daughter gave, a few people obviously tried to replicate Starlight themselves. And Knight Hawkin Light, a YouTuber, actually made his own concoction using cornstarch, baking soda, and PVA glue, which honestly kind of worked incredibly well. I mean, I don't know how edible PVA glue technically is, unless you're like that weird kid in nursery that used to eat glue. But he later swapped out a few things in the recipe, making it even better, but still never getting to quite the same level that the official Starlight was at. So what exactly is used to make Starlight? Well, honestly, we may just never know. Starlight was obviously bought up by a larger company. It is a closely guarded secret as they obviously don't want any imitations or competitors out there. But either way, it is a super cool little product. They should just paint that stuff everywhere, like on ceilings and walls and trash cans and trees and dogs. There'd be no fires ever again. Suzanne Lindholm. So this was a 25 year old woman who was assaulted and killed in the basement of her compartment building in Helsinki, 1976. On the night of her initial disappearance, she planned to go out partying essentially or celebrating with her sister, drinking, dancing, all that good stuff. She asked one of her male friends to give her a lift to the area, which he did, and then she and her sister went out for a meal. Then they had a few drinks, and then they moved on to the Helsinki Club, which was a popular nightclub in the area. While she was at this nightclub, Suzanne met an unidentified Norwegian man, who was actually just visiting the area on a business trip. She kind of hit it off with him. The two went back to his hotel room, while her sister left them for the night and decided to go back home. So this unidentified Norwegian man is clearly a suspect, right? Well, that wasn't really Really where the night ended. Apparently, they shared a few whiskeys in his hotel room before Suzanne decided to head back home and not stay the night at his, which was probably a good idea. This was around 3 a.m. and the man didn't come with her, but they just exchanged phone numbers and planned to meet up the next day to grab like a coffee and have a proper date sort of thing. And it was just after 3 a.m. that Suzanne was seen by witnesses outside of the hotel. It is thought that she intended to walk home, which was roughly an hour's walk, and that was actually the last time that she was ever seen alive. She didn't hitchhike, she didn't have money for a cab, and there is no evidence that anyone really picked her up at all. At around 4am, so around an hour after she was seen at the hotel, a tenant in Suzanne's apartment building was woken up by the sound of a woman crying, but he never went out to check. There were also various other reports of noise, such as footsteps on the stairs outside, and the sounds of a man and woman talking or arguing, and the cellar door to the building slamming shut. And then, silence. None of these sounds were, at the time, substantial enough for anyone to actually do anything about it. Nobody left their rooms to check or called the police or anything like that. They thought it might have just been a light domestic dispute or someone coming home drunk and being dramatic, that sort of thing. But it was obviously much, much worse and darker than they thought. The next afternoon, a man named Esco, who was a tenant in the same building, went down to the cellar to grab a bicycle pump and there he found Sue Suzanne's body. She had been assaulted, strangled to death, and just left there. Now, as far as suspects go, the police had a few leads to go on, but honestly, there weren't too many. They questioned the male friend that dropped Suzanne off, the Norwegian man that was on a business trip that had a few drinks with Suzanne, but they apparently both had pretty solid alibis for those few hours. They questioned a somewhat nervous cab driver who was kind of working and operating in the area at the time, but again, he had a pretty solid alibi and was cleared as a suspect fairly quickly. And that was 
pretty much it for the immediate suspects. So police started to widen their search. They interviewed dozens of people who were just on the street or might have seen something at the time. And they interviewed a ton of previous offenders who had, you know, similar crimes like abducting or assaulting women or even just anything violent or aggressive in any manner. So any of these people who were within 100 miles of this scene, they basically interviewed them. And nothing really came of any of this. They also found out that Suzanne had likely fought back against her killer, as she had some of their DNA under her fingernails, which meant that she likely scratched them quite hard. And so when police released this, they were flooded with loads of reports from hospitals or scar treatment centers about scratches on faces or backs or necks. And after eventually working their way through all of these ones, they still turned up nothing. And that was basically as far as the investigation went. The cellar itself was locked behind three doors and the only people that had the keys were the tenants. And Suzanne's keys were actually in her pocket at the time, along with the lack of noise. Like, you know, there was some noise like the arguing and the crying, but there wasn't like huge amounts of noise. So it's thought that Suzanne was coerced likely into opening up the doors, likely through some sort of threat. And honestly, this is a pretty sad and brutal case. The heartbreaking loss of a beautiful woman by all people's accounts. Apparently she couldn't walk down the street without people, you know, taking a second look at her, which honestly and sadly might have been the reason that she was attacked in the first place. But aside from the physical, she also had a beautiful soul. She was by all accounts a super silly, strong, kind person. And as I said, no one was ever caught or convicted of her murder. And so this case to this day still remains open. The Techno Viking. So the Techno Viking is this legendary guy. He was in a video from the Fuck Parade, which lovely name for an event, in the year 2000 in Germany. In the video, there's a few people dancing around, then some man, he seems like he's had a few drinks too many, stumbles in and ends up grabbing a woman. Then the techno viking comes in, grabs the man, turns him around, tells him off, sends him back the other way, and then the techno parade continues and the techno viking just carries on dancing down the street. So as I said, it was filmed in the year 2000 and it was then uploaded online and in 2006, 2007 started to go incredibly viral. And along with it, there were questions about whether it was real or whether it was staged. Also, who the Techno Viking was. And in 2013, the Techno Viking, who was at the time still unidentified and actually still is to this day unidentified, filed a lawsuit against the guy who filmed this and then produced it and turned it into a video that ended up going viral, the Viking sued him for infringement of personality rights. And he actually won the lawsuit. The court ordered Fritsch, who was the guy who filmed this whole thing, to pay the unidentified Viking 13,000 euro in damages, pretty much all of the ad revenue he had made from the video and from the sales of Techno Viking merchandise and around 10,000 euro in court costs. And he was to completely stop all publications of the Vikings image. This video is pretty epic and it's a great watch, honestly. A great piece of internet history, but as I said, still to this day, we still don't know who the Techno Viking actually was. The bloop. Ah, the bloop. So the bloop was this loud, loud noise, louder than any common whale or sea creature that we know of, detected by the US National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, which is a mouthful, but you can call them NOAA for short. This was in 1997 and it was really very strange because mostly of the pattern of this sound. The signature of it was quite rapid, which is similar to that made of animals and creatures. But the volume of this sound was, as I said, far, far louder than anything we've ever heard before. People have theorized that this could have been ice ridges rubbing against each other or smashing into each other or something known as an ice quake. Or it could be the awakening of long forgotten, ancient, powerful, demonic, massive ocean beasts, which would be my guess. But we never did hear the bloop again, so it's very hard to tell, especially now, what it actually was. The body. So this one was like a creepy, terrifying treasure hunt. In April 2019, someone posted up onto Facebook two images. The first image was of a drawer of some kind and written in Sharpie on the drawer, it said the truth is under. And the second photo, which 
which looked like it was just of the underside of the same drawer. Again, written in Sharpie, it said the body lies at and then gave some coordinates. So after being posted on Facebook, this inevitably spread to Reddit. And from there, a bunch of people started to work on the case. People were trying to figure out where the drawer was or where it was from, where the coordinates were and who wrote in the Sharpie and when. For the coordinates, they tracked them down to Florida, but more specifically to a military installed bombing range. And even though the Reddit users did all of the legwork, found the exact location of the coordinates, they weren't really able to go and explore there as it, you know, was basically like a military base. You can't just walk into those things and start digging around. So the clues and the hype for this case kind of started to trickle down and the Reddit investigation soon just came to a close. As there was no new info coming in, their leads had all come to dead ends. They had already tracked the coordinates. That was also a dead end. Until a woman online, we'll call her Woman B, posted that she was currently in possession of this drawer. Now, one of the problems originally was that the photos were posted by a woman. Again, let's just call her woman A. They were posted by woman A and she said she worked in a goodwill store that obviously received product and furniture and then sold them off for charity. And she said when these drawers came in, she took photos of them and then they sold them off the same day. So when the investigations blew up online, nobody really had any physical access to the drawers. Until now, woman B posted videos and photos of the drawers along with a paper with her username and the current date on to kind of prove that she still actually had them and this wasn't like an old recording or something. But how had she acquired it? Well, she bought it from the Goodwill store, right? This is where things start to get a little bit weird. Woman B actually worked and still works in a workshop that gets furniture in from various places, cleans it up, does it up, fixes it up, and sells it on. Not a Goodwill, but like a whole ass proper furniture workshop. And this particular piece of furniture, she says has been sitting in her workshop for at least the past two years. And bear in mind, the original photos that woman A posted were only posted a few months ago. Meaning either those photos were taken inside of this workshop a few months ago, with woman and A somehow coming in, somehow taking photographs of it, and then making up this whole story about working in a Goodwill and finding it there. Or there's something else going on here. Woman B said she didn't know the identity of Woman A and said that Woman A has never worked here and doesn't work here. So then people started to come up with more theories. One of them, the most likely one, I think, was that the original photos weren't taken when the woman said that they were. Woman A likely worked in a Goodwill store she likely received this furniture, did it up and sold it on the same day. But this was years ago and she only just recently posted the photos a few months ago. So with not too much else to go on, the photos and coordinates were given to authorities in Florida. And that was basically the end of the case, at least officially. Unofficially, Reddit users were still pulling up missing persons reports, unsolved murders and trying to figure out what actually lay at these coordinates. The drawers seemingly certainly existed. But was the whole thing just a hoax or a prank to mess with people? Were the original photos actually taken months ago or years ago or even decades ago? And even if we know when the photos were taken, when was the writing or the Sharpies actually written? The messages themselves could have been taken decades ago. And the furniture has been sold, donated, fixed seemingly many, many times over the years. So it doesn't seem likely that this case will honestly go anywhere. But it is a very strange and I think unique little dark treasure hunt sort of thing that we will likely never come to the bottom of. The hum is the name given to this widespread humming heard by thousands of people worldwide throughout the years. Almost any country you can name has some reports of this hum and we're not exactly sure what it actually is. It is a low persistent invasive hum which I mean, that's the worst type of a hum, invasive hum. These reports have been coming in for the past 50 years, and it's unclear whether they're all separate incidents or all connected in some way, or if they're of alien or government origin, you know, like aiming and shooting little humming noises into our brains, or if they're from a mechanical source, such as machinery, industrial plants, or far off busy highways, or whether they're of a medical origin from something like tinnitus. The hum could honestly be any of these things, all of these 
these things or even none of them and we may likely never have a definitive answer for this one. The Tokyo Metropolitan Murders. So this was a series of 10 murders, mostly of women, in Japan between 1968 and 1974. The general MO or style for the killer would be to break into a woman's apartment, often late at night, attack them, assault them, and then burn down the apartment with the woman in it. This was the general MO, but it was mixed up quite a few times. There was a bunch of these women's bodies found outside or on the side of a road or on a construction site or what have you, and they weren't all exactly the same, which doesn't mean it's a serial killer, but it also doesn't rule it out at the same time. Now, as I said, all of these killings took place between 1968 and 1974. And in 1974, after years of investigations, police arrested a 37-year-old construction worker named Etsuo Ono. They arrested him on suspicion of theft, but while in there, they interviewed and interrogated him over the string of murders. He had a history of theft, of burglary, of attacking people, and of arson, or setting fire to things. So, he seemed to match the profile pretty well. He was once actually convicted of breaking into an apartment in Tokyo and trying to assault a woman who was sleeping in the apartment. He had apparently the same blood type as the killer. He was somewhat familiar with the general area that the killings took place in. He had somewhat flimsy alibis for those particular nights and his technique for the burglaries and for getting into people's apartments was the same that the killer used during these murders. So things were weren't looking great for this Ono guy. And the media were basically all convinced. They named him as the killer before he was even convicted. And in 1986, after actually confessing to the murders, he was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. But in 1991, five years later, Ono said that he was threatened and tortured by the police into making this confession. And he said that he had never killed anyone. And since a lot of the evidence for this was circumstantial, aside from his confession. Once his confession was thrown out, he was eventually acquitted and he was released as a free man. And that is where the case currently sits today. One of the murders was actually later solved with the killer being confirmed and convicted, but all of the other cases are still open and they are thought to be connected to a single killer. So, I mean, do you think Ono did it? It kind of looks like he may have just based on his history and based on some of the circumstantial evidence. But then again, if you pick and choose the right evidence and facts and you know, allegedly torture a confession out of someone, it's somewhat easy to paint someone as a killer. So, I mean, who really knows? Tom Johnson was a man who murdered a woman called Heather Uffelman and attempted to murder her fiance, Jeremy Rolfs, in 1992, Tennessee. This was obviously in the 90s and the couple were selling a $30,000 state-of-the-art computer system. And so they posted some adverts in some of the local trade papers. A man named Tom Johnson responded to these ads. He talked with Jeremy and a few days later agreed to meet up with them and to buy the computer. The agreement was that Tom would buy the computer for $31,000 and Jeremy and his fiance Heather would deliver everything to Tom's office a few hours away, which is fair enough. So they packed everything into the car, made the five odd hour journey up there, and this is where the first sign of things feeling a little bit dodgy started to appear. Tom said not to meet at his office, as the directions were a little bit complex, so he just suggested they meet at a local motel instead. A bit weird. Then when they arrived, Tom said his business partner would be arriving shortly with the check. So while they waited for him, he said they should just load everything everything into Tom's car to save time when the business partner eventually did come. Again, a little bit suspicious. But at the time, Jeremy said he didn't really suspect anything or think anything weird of this. Tom apparently was very confident. He gave off an air of legitimacy, of trustworthiness, of friendliness, and he said he didn't suspect Tom for a second. So they packed everything into Tom's car, then went into the motel room to wait for the business partner. But after 20 minutes of waiting, Jeremy started to get understandably impatient, and he asked Tom to, you know, check on 
on his business partner, see how far he was away, and then Tom pulled out a gun. He took Jeremy's money belt from him and had Heather lay out the room's bedsheets on the floor. The couple were then made to wrap themselves up in these bedsheets, essentially immobilizing them, and Tom said that he would be taking the computer, but that Jeremy would receive a check from the insurance company anyway, so it's like no hard feelings sort of thing. He assured them that everything was going to be fine, no one was going to be hurt, but then just moments later, Tom pulled out a hammer and smashed Jeremy in the head with it. Jeremy's head was spinning, his ears were ringing, it was a really hard hit. Tom then went over to Heather, hit her with the hammer, and she naturally started to scream, and this apparently just made Tom hit her even more. In this madness, Jeremy shouted at Heather to just stop screaming and the man would stop, but the man just kept hitting her and then wiped down his fingerprints from the motel room and just left. After a while, Jeremy crawled over to Heather and she was in a bad state. The couple were eventually found and taken to hospital and sadly Heather died just a few hours later. Jeremy did pull through but he was never really the same afterwards and sadly five years after this he was killed in a car accident when he smashed head-on with another driver in South Africa. So an extremely tragic case that honestly could have just been a robbery. Like it's never really been determined or revealed why this guy just started attacking them. He he had all of their cash, he had them fully restrained, he had all the equipment already loaded into his car, but maybe the attack was the actual point of the whole meeting. Now, Tom Johnson was obviously likely just an alias, and suspects and leads kind of came and went over the years, but one of the more promising suspects was a man named Thomas E. Steeples. He was a 49-year-old computer company owner who lived in Nashville, Tennessee, which is where the murders took place. He had just committed, two years after the original attack, a double murder in a motel room of a young couple, Rob and Kelly Phillips, beating them to death after learning them there with a promise of a record deal, which sounds very eerily familiar to the first case. He also had a string of past attacks and assaults, and he actually looked somewhat in many people's eyes, like the sketch done of Tom Johnson. But later that year, Thomas Steeples died of an overdose in prison, and he was never linked with or charged with or connected with the original incident. So was Thomas Steeples actually Tom Johnson? And was he the man wanted for this horrific attack and killing? Or was it someone else entirely? Did he even want the computer? And was this his first kind of practice trial run attack, which he followed up on two years later, we may never know. The Tunguska event. So this was this giant explosion that took place in Siberia in 1908. This was in something called a meteor airburst, which is when a meteor is flying down towards Earth, but instead of hitting Earth, it explodes before it hits the surface. This still obviously does a massive amount of damage, obviously depending on its size, but this one in Tunguska was the largest meteoric airburst ever recorded, like ever. If you look at the size of some of the recorded airbursts before and after them, you'll see numbers like 5 kilotons of TNT, or 10, or 20, or even up to like 50 or 100. But most of them are kind of that sort of ballpark. But the Tunguska event was an estimated 15,000 kilotons. Just absurd magnitudes larger than any other event we have seen like this. The damage that this explosion did was incredible. Destroying buildings, flattening over 2,000 square kilometers of forest, killing countless animals as well as roughly three humans. The human death reports are a little unclear on this one, but regardless it still did an insane amount of damage. There's not too much mystery to this one, as it seems to be pretty widely accepted that this was a meteoric airburst, but in doing a further deep dive into this one, I found that there were some a little bit wild, some would say unhinged theories, saying that the explosion was either an early nuclear test by the Russians, who I guess invented and developed it 30 years before the Americans, and then just never spoke about it or used it, or it was aliens destroying the meteor for us, possibly reducing the impact damage and saving some of humanity, such noble aliens. But regardless, it was an incredibly powerful and crazy event that likely 
hopefully it won't be topped anytime soon. The Voynich Manuscript. Well, 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 how the turns have tabled. So I think I've covered now, in this iceberg, every standalone episode I've ever done. I covered the Voynich Manuscript actually as the first ever video that I made, on this channel at least, and it'll always be there for you to watch, as I will never delete any of my old content, no matter how, um, cringe and poor quality it is. I mean, I think I did a pretty good job into research and actually covering the case, but if I showed you my camera and microphone setup at the time, you would probably find it extremely hilarious. It was on this huge stack of books propped up against an empty glass. It, it was just madness. But the Voynich Manuscript or the Voynich Codex was a book essentially discovered by a rare books collector, Wilfred Voynich, in 1912. This book is quite long at over 200 pages, with many of the pages actually folding out two or three times. But this is all mostly normal for the time. Like a random old foldy codex isn't really anything to write an entry about, nor was it that interesting. But what was interesting about it was basically everything inside of the book. The whole book is written in basically this unknown language. It's not English, it's not Latin, it's not Arabic. It's basically a language that's completely alien to us, with alien being one of the major theories on this. The drawings and illustrations inside of it are all of plants, of medicines, of astrological and biological things that simply don't exist, at least not on Earth. The drawings and the text have been attempted to be figured out and deciphered and decoded over the years, but they never successfully have been. And I get into a bunch of the potential authors for this book in my full video, and these range from Roger Bacon, who was this super cool crazy scientist dude who experimented with glass and mirrors and telescopes, and some of his experiments were pretty cool at the time, you know, using concaved or convexed glass to do kind of weird things with light, and it is thought in this theory that Roger Bacon developed one of the first ever microscopes, something that wouldn't officially be invented for centuries after his death. And with this secret microscope, he was able to look down and see bacteria and microbes and all sorts of little squiggly things, and this is apparently what some of the drawings are referring to, as they do honestly look a little bacteria-like. But as he had been accused of witchcraft in the past, he wasn't actually able to tell anyone about this. So he drew what he saw essentially, maybe changing them a little bit to look more like a plant or something. And he wrote about his findings, but he encoded all of the writing so that no one could come along, find his book, and then, I don't know, burn him at the cross for it. Another theorized author for this book is a man named Edward Kelly, who was a bit of a con man, a bit of a smooth talker, a bit of a charlatan. This theory says that he created the codex as a hoax in order to sell it to some foolish rich person. And Edward Kelly actually had a history of essentially doing just this. He had made some fake items in the past and actually sold them on. He had convinced some people that he was smarter than he actually was, that he could perform alchemy and change random metals into gold sort of thing. And he was quite a close acquaintance of a man named John Dee who sold the manuscript to Emperor Rudolf II. And this emperor is basically as far back as we can officially trace the document to. So a few things line up on that one. Another theory was that this was the work of a young Leonardo da Vinci. Wrong Leonardo. But Leonardo da Vinci was a clever artistic kid who obviously came up with many inventions in the future and he is probably one that could and would come up with an entire fake language along with fake plants and fake astrological signs and also the parchment and ink that the codex was made with would have been fairly expensive. So since da Vinci came from a fairly well-off family, that for some people kind of strengthen this theory. And then there's obviously the theory of aliens either inspiring this or directly creating it themselves, which there's not too much evidence to support this one, but it is a fun one to think about. And over the years, there has honestly been a ton of dedication to trying to figure out where this comes from, what it actually means, but people haven't gotten too much closer to actually figuring it out. There are different components of the book that give slightly different ages, and some of these ages completely rule out some of the potential authors that we have mentioned before. So like anytime a great theory and a great candidate for an author come out, 
out, there's seemingly always some other piece of evidence that contradicts that and basically makes it impossible. The carbon dating of the book put its creation at some time around the 1400s, which does line up with this drawing in the book of this particular castle battlement style called a swallow tail, which was only built in Italy and it was only built around the 13th and 14th centuries. So that is likely where the book first came from. But as I said, outside of this, we don't really know much. This is a wild mystery and it's probably, at least to me, one of the top 10 mysteries of all time. If only just because of how fun and deep and mysterious the whole thing is. Mwah, fantastic mystery. The Wahila is this strange wolf-like creature spotted mainly in Alaska and is sort of this direwolf sort of creature. It is larger and heavier than all other wolves in the area spotted, and it has a large head and large paws. Its fur is apparently completely white, and there is evidence that through paw prints, they've seen that this creature's little toe beans are more widely spread out than a regular wolf. It is roughly four feet tall at the shoulder, which my god, that is huge for a wolf. And it is known in legends as being an evil spirit that roams around, kills people, and removes their heads. So, quite fittingly, it is native to the Nahani, which is otherwise known as the Headless Valley. Theories say that it could be an Amphysianid, which are long thought to have been extinct, or a Direwolf, again, long thought to have been extinct, or it could just be a new species of canine or wolf, which we haven't yet discovered, but whose MO is to roam around Alaska, killing things and lopping off their heads. Scary. The Wall Street bombing. So this was an attack, an explosion that took place in September 1920 at Wall Street in the financial district of New York. It was noon September 16th when a horse-drawn wagon pulled up outside and parked up on the street opposite the JP Morgan Bank. This was one of the busiest corners on Wall Street and it was around lunchtime which meant it was even busier than usual. Most of the errand boys or messengers were running around, people weren't at Park, they were out for lunch somewhere, so the street was extremely busy. The driver of the wagon was seen parking up, leaving the wagon, and running down a side street. And then, moments later, the entire wagon explodes. It had been loaded with roughly 45 kilos of dynamite and roughly 230 kilos of these cast iron sash weights. And when the timer went off, the dynamite exploded and the small cast iron weights acted basically as like shrapnel and in the end it left 40 people dead and 143 seriously injured. People were obviously in shock, it was mayhem, nobody really knew how bad the attacks were or if more attacks were coming and during all of this chaos one 17 year old messenger James Saul commandeered a parked car and in multiple trips drove 30 people from the site of the incident to a nearby hospital. So I mean this dude just honestly deserves a medal. But to to this day, we still don't know who orchestrated or arranged this attack. The district attorney suspected that since the attack happened on Wall Street in the financial district, that perhaps the perpetrators were enemies of capitalism. So people like the Bolsheviks, the anarchists, or the communists. During the investigation, trying to figure out who actually might have been behind this, they stumbled upon a bunch of flyers stuffed into a nearby post box at Wall Street, and it was found out that they had been stuffed in there just before the explosion. The flyers read, Remember, we will not tolerate any longer. Free the political prisoners or it will be sure death for all of you. And it was signed, American Anarchist Fighters. So who was this elusive group of people? Well, police started investigations trying to figure that out. They couldn't locate the driver of the wagon, so that was a dead end. They tried to investigate the horse that had pulled the wagon onto the street and where it might have gotten its metal shoes fitted. And they actually found the blacksmith that put the metal shoes shoes on the horse, but it seems like he wasn't connected to the people at all, and he didn't have a lot of information on the perpetrators. There was also this guy, a tennis champion actually, called Edwin Fisher, who had sent out postcards to a bunch of his friends, warning them to leave that area by September 16th, which was the day of the attack. A bit 
suspect, but when police investigated him, he apparently had a habit of doing this, of sending out these sorts of postcards, and he told police that he had gotten the information through the air, kind of through the grapevine sort of thing, and so police just kind of classed him as insane and committed him to an actual insane asylum, which is maybe just a bit of an overreaction. So, none of these trails really worked out, and for over three years, the case basically went cold, until one group of Italian anarchists, the Gallianists, were investigated, and Mario Buda, who was a member of the group, drew attention to the authorities. He is thought, most likely by some people, to be the guy who made and planted the bomb for this attack. He personally had a history and a wealth of experience with making explosives, and in using dynamite and sash weights, very similar to the ones used in the actual attack, for making his bombs. And two of his associates, Sacco and Vanzetti, were both arrested and indicted just before the attacks, which kind of adds context to the flyers demanding that authorities free the political prisoners, and so it seems this is very likely linked. Buddha was never charged or arrested for these attacks, as soon after this, Buddha took a boat back to Italy and never returned to the US. So that's one theory about one guy in one group, but officially no individual and no group has ever taken responsibility for the attacks. So to this day, we just don't officially know. The Wessex Way Beast. So this was a creature spotted on CCTV in Dorset in 2007. The video is honestly a little creepy. It kind of looks like a deer, but is very canine, almost dog or wolf-like, but it seems to be a lot larger and more lanky than a dog, with these somewhat creepy legs, and also at the same time it seems to look like none of these animals, but also all of them, and also also maybe a little bit human. This is the only footage we have of the creature, and the beast itself was never captured, so it may to this day still be out there, roaming around, stalking and hunting the Knight of Dorset. Whatever Happened to Robot Jones was a cartoon show that ran for two seasons in 2002 and 3. It was a pretty cool series for the time, kind of mimicking some of the animation style of more classic cartoons from like the 80s, but one thing that was especially unique about the show, aside from the animation, was the voice used for the main character, Robot Jones. Because Robot Jones was well, a robot. The creator of the show, Greg Miller, wanted it to seem as authentic as possible, so he used Microsoft Word's text-to-speech function in order to actually get all of the voice lines for Robot Jones. I am ready for my daily informational programming. Miller apparently went to great effort to change the tone and the pitch of the voice, you know, to make it very unique and exactly how he wanted it. He would spell a lot of the words phonetically and space them out and put in certain punctuation to get the reading of the line to be as accurate as to what he envisioned as possible. He was basically doing kind of voice acting for the computer, which is pretty cool and I do really appreciate his attention to detail on this. But for season two, executives at Cartoon Network thought that this is a bit weird and unusual, so they wanted to hire a kid and just bring them in to do the voice lines for Robot Jones. So that's what they did. They brought in a child voice actor, he redid all of the lines for season two before it went out, and they also redubbed all of the lines for season one, and then whenever there were reruns for season one, they would instead show the dubbed child voice actor version. Now all of the episodes with the original robot voice for season one have been located, but none of the episodes for season two have yet been found or collected. Miller said that he may possibly still own some VHS copies of the original season two episodes, with obviously the original robot voice in, but it's unconfirmed as to whether he does actually have these VHS tapes or not, so this could honestly just be another case of some lost media. Who put Bella in the witch elm? So this is a graffito, which yes, I didn't know there was a singular form of graffiti either, but there you go. This is a graffito that was written and made following the discovery of a body found by some local boys in Worcester, England, 1943. The four boys were doing what boys do, roaming around, exploring fields, climbing trees, and being on land that they shouldn't be on. So when they were out, one of the boys saw a large witch elm, which is a type of tree. And he then climbed the tree as he was looking for bird's eggs, like in a bird's nest to take home, which 
I guess, is a hobby. But he climbed the tree looking for these bird's eggs. And when he went up there, he realized that the trunk of the witch elm was hollow. And inside the trunk, he saw a skull. Now, originally, he thought it was just a animal skull, as you probably would assume just right off the bat. But it was a human skull. All of the boys kind of took a closer look at this, realized it was a human skull, then got freaked out, put the skull back, and decided to just all go home and never tell anyone about this. Firstly, because they found a body, essentially, and secondly, because the land that they found it on wasn't theirs or public land, so they were trespassing on the land, essentially, and they thought they might get in trouble for that. But the eldest boy in the group did feel a bit uneasy not telling anyone about this, and so he just decided to tell his parents, they told the police, and this investigation was started about who put Bella in the witch elm. They found the complete skeleton inside the tree, they found a shoe, a wedding ring, some clothing, and they determined that this body belonged to a woman, and that she had died roughly a year and a half ago, likely being placed in the trunk while she was still warm, as if rigor mortis had already set in, she wouldn't have been able to be kind of folded up and put in the tree trunk, which is a very gruesome thought. So someone had killed this woman, likely from suffocation from the evidence, and soon after she died, came out here, took the body, and put her down into this tree trunk. So some pretty horrific stuff. Police tried to match her up with various missing persons reports, but they couldn't find a match. So they tried dental records, but again couldn't find a match. So the lady basically remained unidentified for years. But she became known as Bella because of the graffito that was written shortly after her discovery. But in 2014, some theories regarding the identity of this woman started to surface. And one of the candidates was a sex worker named Bella, who often worked nearby and disappeared just three years before this body was found. And if the body was of this woman called Bella, then whoever wrote the original graffito must have somehow known that, because they used her name Bella, and so they likely knew Bella's name and identity, even when no one else at the time, including the police, knew it. And honestly, that seems to be the best theory that I could find on this. There are a few other theories, including it being a Dutch woman, who was like caught up in a giant spy ring, to a woman being killed in a occult ritual, to a few other either romantic or less romantic theories, but they all seem to have not very much evidence for them, or they actually have evidence actively disproving the theory. And so, with that said, Bella, whoever she was, was never officially identified, the killer was never identified or caught or found, and to this day we still don't know who put Bella in the witch elm, or who even wrote that original graffito. And we also learnt about the word graffito. The wood booger is creepy as heck. I mean, just look at this beast. The wood booger is kind of this Bigfoot-like creature who is often seen and spoken of in and around the woods of West Virginia and is named the wood booger because it carries children off like the boogeyman. And the wood part of its name is because it lives in the woods. So, yeah. What are you gonna do? Not a very creative name, but still a scary and terrifying creature nonetheless. The wow signal. Wow. Harry Potter. Wow. 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 So this entry was fascinating to learn about, and it was basically this radio signal detected in 1977 by the Big Ear Radio Telescope in Ohio. This is just a huge listening device pointed at space, and it essentially just listens for radio signals. And in this photo, you can see the signal that was received and circled with the word WOW being written next to it, hence it being dubbed as the WOW signal. So to understand why this was such a a crazy signal, we need to decode all of these numbers and letters just a little bit. They all represent the strength of the signal, essentially, with 1 being a strength of 1, 2 being a strength of 2, all the way up to 10, and then with A representing a strength of 11, B representing a strength of 12, C of 13, etc., all the way up to Z, which is 36. So within this massive sea of essentially background radio waves, all these 1s and 2s and 3s, there was this little blip of this gradually rising signal strength 
that goes at its highest point all the way up to U, which is a signal strength of 31, and then it slowly fades down. The signal translated onto this heat map kind of gives a visual representation of the blip itself, as does this graph here, and a signal this strong is incredibly unusual. And so this particular radio event has been cited as the greatest evidence we have ever received of an alien radio transmission, like ever. Yosemite Sam Numbers Station. So this was a rumoured numbers station that apparently made these random broadcasts in 2004 and 5. Numbers stations are something that I covered in my Fallout iceberg, but they're basically these secret radio stations that broadcast out these strings of seemingly random numbers, hence Numbers Station. They are historically used to address spies who are abroad, because it is often too risky to contact these undercover spies directly, so these number stations are set up to essentially deliver some important message. They are broadcast out on a particular signal at a particular time of day, which the undercover spy would know beforehand, and you send out a string of seemingly meaningless numbers and letters, and the spy can just tune in from anywhere, any part of the country, he just needs a radio basically. He tunes into these, writes down all of the numbers and letters, and then decodes them with a prearranged cipher that only he knows. And this translates into like an actual message that the spy can read. So it's an almost risk-free way of communicating with undercover spies. It's pretty straightforward and simple, as you'd need to be pretty savvy to catch the signal. And even if you do catch it, it's just basically a string of random letters and numbers. You'd need the special cipher to make any sense of it. They originated in World War One and seem to pop up quite frequently with radio enthusiasts who apparently spend their whole day listening to radio, but like special radio, not like heart FM. But these radio enthusiasts, when they discover a number station, they will often name and tag it to distinguish it from the other number stations. And this one was dubbed Yosemite Sam because it often featured recordings of the Warner Brother character Yosemite Sam. These broadcasts went out over a month-long period between 2004 and 2005, and people actually traced the broadcasts back to a radio test site operated by Laguna Industries, who are a military equipment contractor. So who were these broadcasts for? Why were they being sent out? And why by this military contractor in particular? And I think most importantly, why were they using audio clips of Yosemite Sam in their broadcasts? These are all honestly good questions but they may, in all fairness, never be answered. The Xia Dynasty. So this is the first ever dynasty in China, but there is actually very, very little surviving evidence for it. And there are various scholars and historians who even debate its existence at all. There are no surviving documents from the time of the Xia dynasty, as it was thought to be around 2000 BC, so like 4000 years ago, and the oldest surviving writing or inscriptions in China are from around 300 years after the dynasty ended. So we just have accounts referencing the dynasty essentially, but none that were actually written or made during the dynasty. The dynasty was thought to be founded around, as I said, 2000 BC, and it ruled for around four or five hundred years before being overthrown essentially by the Shang dynasty, which was then eventually overthrown by the Zhou dynasty. But we kind of have direct evidence for all of these, but not much or even none for the Xia dynasty, which has led many people to think or believe that the Xia Xia dynasty was simply a legend, like it was just a tale and story that was told so often over the years that it kind of became blended with actual history. And I mean, it's certainly possible because it was honestly so far back that records of really any kind were somewhat unreliable, if not very unreliable. And so if people didn't really have records of things and over the generations the story of the Xia dynasty became kind of mixed in with the stories of previous dynasties, then it could very well have been blended in with actual history. There is also this culture or society in China called the Erlitu culture, and some historians and archaeologists generally link up the Xia dynasty to the Erlitu culture, saying they're essentially the same thing and that the Erlitu culture finds are from the Xia dynasty. But again, this is kind of just speculation, as there's no really hard solid evidence, especially written evidence, for this connection. So yeah, was 
the Shia dynasty actually real? Was it myth? Was it legend? Or was it kind of a bit of both? At least right now, we don't really know. Daisaku Chiba. So Daisaku Chiba was a 20 year old manga artist and student who in 2007 was stabbed to death while riding his bike home in Kyoto, Japan. He was just cycling home as usual when he met coming towards him another cyclist. It is thought that they maybe had a close call in hitting into each other as they both stopped their bikes, got off, and then this other cyclist approached Chiba. He then started to act incredibly strangely and then he just lunged out and attacked Chiba. So I'll show you this video of what is thought to be a close reenactment of what the guy was doing. He was just swaying from side to side essentially in kind of a weird manner and just yelling insults at Chiba. And then after doing this for a while with Chiba just standing there, this man pulled out a knife and just attacked Chiba. He stabbed him over a dozen times in his chest and they both fell backwards into the field behind them. Another cyclist who passed a little while later Later, said that he saw this man just sitting on the street facing away from the field and away from Chiba and he said he saw Chiba just lying in the field and obviously bleeding to death. The passing cyclist said that he feared for his life. He passed the scene but then shortly afterwards came and circled back and when he came back the man was gone and Chiba had climbed up from the field and was now sitting on the street trying to call his friend and trying to call an ambulance. He was taken to the hospital very quickly, but sadly died shortly after from his wounds. Now, although investigations for this case were immediately carried out, the case didn't really seem to go anywhere and it was never solved. They had a rough idea of what the man looked like, of what his bike looked like, and since it was a quite short range bike, they figured that the killer had to live in like this certain perimeter, but they did all this investigation, they did interviews, and still weren't able to solve the case or to come up with any major breakthroughs and this was honestly an incredibly sad case as Chiba was essentially just a kid like 20 years old he was quite young he was a student and he seemed to be quite kind friendly and creative making some incredible art i'm really hoping that this case gets solved soon and that the psycho who did this to him actually gets brought to justice help me help me susie's dying so this entry is actually a duplicate entry i covered it towards the end of the last tier so i don't think i need to cover it again it's basically this phone number that you can or could call from a UK public telephone box and when you call the number it would result in the voice of a monotonous woman saying over and over and over again help me Susie's dying. It would keep saying this until you hung up the phone and it was connected to either being a myth or a hoax or was an actual telephone number set up by someone that was a myth or a hoax or of it being a psyops sort of thing or of the phone number itself being basically possessed and haunted by a dead woman named Susie. There's not much else known about the recording or where it's from but it is a creepy one nonetheless. Don Henry and Kevin Ives. So in the summer of 1987 in Arkansas there was this mile long six ton train that was running along its tracks late at night which was perfectly normal for its schedule but after riding through town after town it eventually came to the small little place of Alexander Arkansas. And when coming through Alexander, the driver of the train, casually looking out of the window, saw something on the tracks. And he couldn't quite make out what it was. But as the train drew a little closer, he got a better look at it, realized what it is, and started to panic. Lying on the tracks were two boys Don and Kevin and they showed no signs of moving, no signs that they were even conscious and so the driver immediately slammed on the brakes and started blasting the horn and still the two boys didn't move a millimeter. This was a heavy mile long train and it wasn't able to stop anywhere near soon enough and so the train ran over the two boys and they were horribly mangled and killed. So. Yeah. The state medical examiner said that they had the devil's lettuce in their system and so police said that they probably just smoked a bunch, passed out on the tracks and just weren't aware of the train coming towards them. So they ruled the two deaths as accidental. Now the parents of the two boys were completely opposed to this conclusion. Don and Kevin weren't really drug users. Like they occasionally might have smoked a little bit but nothing ever heavier than the green stuff and even then they always just smoked like every now and then recreationally and never anywhere near 
near enough to like pass out on a train track. The parents of the boys were very suspicious about this whole thing and they were determined to get to the bottom of it. Now the night in question went something like this. The boys were out with friends, they came home at around midnight, went back to Don's home and Don told his father that the two were going to go out hunting. This was apparently something that was fairly normal for the boys and for some of the other boys in town, so Don's father wasn't worried in the least about this. And this was round about midnight on that night. They were doing a form of hunting called spotlighting, which is where you would get a big spotlight. One person would shine it really quickly on the animal, basically stunning them. The other person would then shoot the animal. This was apparently an illegal form of hunting in Arkansas at the time, but it wasn't like super illegal. There were a bunch of, you know, local kids who did this sort of thing. So the two boys went out to this local hunting area near the train tracks, and when they were leaving the house was the last time that they would be seen until they were spotted by the train driver. And when the train driver gave his account of how exactly the two boys were laid out on the tracks, things just got even weirder and more suspicious. According to the driver, the boys weren't just passed out on the tracks, or like sitting down or laying down on the tracks sort of thing. They were lying straight down on the tracks, like straight across them, legs down, arms down by their sides, both of them in the same position, lying next to each other, and with a green tarp draped over them, almost like they had been staged there. Almost. Some would say definitely. It was determined that they had in their system the equivalent of 20 wacky tobacco cigarettes, which is a lot of cigarettes to have in your system. And the state medical examiner said that they were basically in a deep sleep from all of the cigarettes, and so they had passed out on the tracks and weren't able to hear the oncoming train. But the train wasn't just coming towards them, it was blasting its horn at full power. And these train horns are so stupidly loud that even if you were passed out, you would very likely at least wake up briefly you know, move a little bit, turn your head, anything. But as I said, these boys didn't move a millimeter. So with all of this and with the police basically closing the case and coming to the conclusion that the deaths were accidental, the parents started an investigation of their own using private investigators. Through some back and forths and after being rejected and stunted constantly by the police, the noise that the parents were making actually got the police to reopen the case. And when they reopened the case, it took even more of a wild turn. The case was reopened by a newly appointed prosecutor and he actually had the bodies exhumed and further tests done. And from this they determined that the boys had actually smoked between one and three cigarettes, which is a lot more reasonable than the previous estimation of 20. And these tests suggested that at least one of the boys was already dead when the train hit them and the other one was likely unconscious. So this breakthrough was, to put it lightly, huge. With this evidence, they overturned the ruling of accidental death and officially ruled the two boys' deaths as probable homicide. But that's sadly mostly where the case hit a brick wall. They weren't really able to gather much more evidence than they already had. The bodies had already been exhumed and examined. But one interesting thing that was brought up during this investigation was this unidentified man in military fatigues that had been seen just one week before this incident, walking around, acting all weird and suspicious. The police were actually called out to investigate this man, you know, just have a word with him, ask him where he's from, what he's doing. And when the police stopped to talk to him, the man just pulled out a gun and started shooting at the policeman. The officer ducked down behind the car door and when he got up and, you know, called for help, the man in military fatigues was gone. Then on the night of the incident of the two boys, there were actually several reported sightings of a man in military fatigues, leaving the town less than 200 yards away from where the bodies were found. But despite their best efforts, this man was never identified or found. The prosecutor believes that these two boys either saw something they shouldn't have seen, or stumbled into an area they shouldn't have been in, or annoyed some mentally unstable stable person and they were attacked and killed and then placed on the tracks in order to 
finish them off, as well as to cover up this whole thing as being an accidental death, which, I mean, it very nearly was covered up. And that is where the case currently sits. The deaths were later changed from probable homicide to definite homicide, and there was someone who later came forward and said that they saw on the night of the incident two policemen beating the ever-loving hell out of two boys, throwing them into the back of their car and then driving off. And when the policemen returned, the boys were nowhere to be seen. But it is unknown how reliable this statement was, or if the two boys were even Don and Kevin. So, a very sad, strange, somewhat eerie case that to this day remains unsolved. The crew of the Sarah Joe. So in February 1979, five men took the Sarah Joe, which was a medium-sized fishing boat, out into the Hawaiian waters for essentially a fishing trip. The five men were all pretty close friends and had been for years, and between them they had a few years of fishing and boating experience. So they went out one day to have their, you know, lads fishing trip. The skies were clear, the waters were calm, it was seemingly all good. Until suddenly, just a few hours later, a powerful gust blew down from the mountains, and then soon after, more wind came, and then there was just a full-blown storm passing through the waters. And during this, the Sarah Joe and its crew were nowhere to be seen. One of the men's fathers, John Hanchett Sr., went out as much as he could along the shore, along the beach, and tried to search for the boat, try to even spot it. But as I said, the boat was nowhere to be found. So he went out the next day, this time with a friend, and they searched all day, but again found nothing. Then the search progressed to like a full-blown search with the Coast Guard and helicopters and like everything they could muster. But after five days, the search was officially suspended, and still there was absolutely no sight of the men or of the boat. They did further searches over the next few weeks up and down the shore and the waters, but nothing turned up. And that's where the case ended, until 10 years later, 2,000 miles west of the initial incident, the Sarah Joe was found. It had washed up ashore on a deserted island, and a short distance away from the wreckage of the boat was a makeshift grave, and in the grave they found the remains of one of the five men, Scott Mormon. This drifting voyage of like 2,000 miles would have taken roughly three months to make, and it is thought that the five men were sadly long dead before the boat ever reached its final destination. And then there's the question of who actually buried Scott if none of the other men's bodies were found. Well, while actually investigating the grave, they found buried down alongside Scott a small stack of paper and of foil. And this is thought to be a Chinese burial ritual of sorts, where traditionally gold and or silver foil is buried along with the person in order to represent money or good fortune in the afterlife. So with this, the general theory was that some Chinese fishermen found the boat, and with the boat they found Scott's remains, and so they decided to give him a proper burial. They didn't tell anyone about this, because they were likely illegally fishing in the area, and so just left the boat, buried Scott, and obviously it was found however long later. A pretty tragic one, and since the other bodies were never found, it's not completely clear whether they died at sea, or died shortly after boarding the boat, or actually made it all the way ashore and simply buried Scott themselves and then left and died or disappeared somewhere else. It is thought that maybe Scott tied himself down to the boat to avoid being knocked off and none of the other men did, so they were essentially all washed out to sea and Scott was left tied to the boat when he was found. So a pretty, very tragic case and it's still a little unclear as to what exactly happened. And that is all we have time for. I really hope you enjoyed exploring this fifth tier of the Unsolved Mystery Iceberg with me. Feel free to check out each new episode as they're released. And if you'd like to watch every mystery I've covered so far, I have a full playlist down in the description below in case you want to check out the other tiers, ready for you to binge or to fall asleep to. And as always, thanks for watching.